Earlier today, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. heard oral arguments in the Microsoft antitrust case. Attorneys representing Microsoft and the federal government presented their cases before the seven-judge panel. This session of the hearing is just under three hours. Persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Be seated, please. Case number 005212 et al., United States of America et al. versus Microsoft Corporation, appellant. First issue, monopoly maintenance. Mr. Urowski for appellant, Mr. Menear for appellees. Second issue, tying. Mr. Urowski for appellant, Mr. Roberts for appellees. Because of the breadth and complexity and importance of the issues on appeal, the arguments in this case will be heard over the course of two days. Today, the court will hear arguments on monopoly maintenance and the tying issues. Council will be allowed 75 minutes per side on the monopoly maintenance issue and 45 minutes per side on the tying issue. The court may take a short break after the appellant's opening argument, and then we're likely to take a recess for lunch at the conclusion of the arguments on monopoly maintenance. We will reconvene promptly at the conclusion of any break. Tomorrow, the court will hear arguments on the attempted monopolization, relief, and conduct of the trial and extrajudicial statements. We're now ready to hear arguments. Good morning. Good morning. Chief Judge Edwards, and may it please the court, my name is Richard Urowski, and I represent Microsoft. These are appeals from a final judgment finding Microsoft liable under Sections 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act and ordering a breakup of the company as well as other extreme relief. Before turning directly to the government's monopoly maintenance claim, I'd like to make one point that lies at the heart of this case and cuts across all claims asserted in the complaints. Nothing Microsoft did foreclosed Netscape from any portion of the marketplace. The district court found that Netscape distributed 160 million copies of Navigator in 1998 alone. This was sufficient to saturate the entire marketplace, which consisted of approximately 100 million Internet users at the time. The district court also found that between 1996 and 1998, the period at issue in this case, Netscape's installed base of users increased from 15 million to 33 million. In other words, millions of people chose to use Navigator despite the fact that Internet Explorer was included in every copy of Windows. In fact, James Barksdale, Netscape's CEO, testified that Netscape had between 40 and 70 million users at the time of trial. And internal Netscape documents from October of 1997, a year before the commencement of trial, estimate that Navigator's installed base was 65 million, up from 40 million the year before. That's an increase of 25 million users during the very period when the alleged restraints were supposed to be in effect. This evidence shows that Netscape had unfettered access to consumers. Indeed, Microsoft's inclusion of Internet Explorer in Windows may have facilitated Navigator's distribution by providing a convenient means of downloading the program from the Internet. The absence of any foreclosure from any part of the marketplace undermines every claim in this case. I'd like to turn... Foreclosure means more than simply impeding access? It means preventing access, typically in cases like this, 
by either locking up customers which is not an issue in this case or effectively for closing all channels of distribution and that's the approach that the Supreme Court has adopted well it's the uh, approach certainly that the courts of appeals have adopted uh, the uh, leading case on this point is uh, Omega environmental which is a case from the Ninth Circuit which uh, addresses this very issue uh, the claim in that case uh, your honor was that uh, the defendant had uh, 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 exclusive control over the most desirable means of distribution and the Ninth Circuit rejected that claim as a matter of law uh, determining that there w was the ability on the part of the plaintiff to distribute directly uh, to uh, uh, consumers and to develop alternative distributors and to compete with the defendant for existing distributors and therefore as a matter of law the claim could not be allowed isn't the question though in this part of the case not how much navigator is out there but the extent to which Microsoft's behavior impeded it in other words but for the violations that the district court found navigator would be even more broadly distributed uh, I don't uh, think that's uh, and also the district courts findings at least in this part of the case were not based as I understand it on uh, limiting navigator as a browser but its potential to serve as middleware isn't that what this part of the case is all about uh, your honor I, I, I agree with the second part of that right. uh, I think that there is no uh, uh, evidence that there was any uh, uh, impediment to Netscape's distributing navigator pervasively in the marketplace there is a finding by the district court that Netscape had the ability to offer its software literally to every PC user worldwide to adopt and use so was that finding made as part of the rejection of the exclusive dealing part of the case or this part of the case it's it, it contained in the uh, district courts conclusions of law rejecting but, the exclusive dealing claim. but yes right but it has nothing to do with this uh, I think it has uh, 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 with great respect everything to do with this because the question uh, uh, that I think is pertinent here is whether in any sense Netscape was excluded from the marketplace and that is not a different question under section 1 and section 2 either they were excluded or they were not and the district court found that they were not and dismissed the section 1 claim uh, that uh, alleged that they were on this ground so I think in this regard the district courts findings are just inconsistent Mr. Yorosky, your response has raised something that is a little pervasive or is, is pervasive to your case that is no, our handbook for circuit practice requests that appellants set forth the standard of review and address that has your brief done that uh, I thought we had in our opening brief uh, uh, and the standard uh, obviously uh, is uh, under rule 52 for factual determinations right. that they be accepted referred to what was held as a matter of law in some other case question before us which I'm not sure you did tailor your brief to is the review of findings of fact right uh, I, I think we did address that in our opening brief uh, your honor uh, the standard is obviously the standard set forth in rule 52 yeah, and that standard is, is clearly erroneous clearly erroneous and, and on issues of law there is de novo review and in this context traditionally issues of law have been deemed not only the articulation of legal standards but the proper application of those standards to the facts and the correctness of the analysis from a legal and in this context again economic standpoint are you contending that factual findings underlying the district courts conclusion on this issue are clearly erroneous or are you not so contending uh, we uh, have contested uh, a relatively small number of factual determinations as clearly erroneous however 
it's our position in this court that even if the court were to accept all of the findings of the district court, the decision below would have to be reversed in all respects as a matter of law. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, what I maybe immodestly would call a programmatic uh, examination of the monopoly maintenance claim. And I'd like to start out by addressing the question of anti-competitive conduct because I think that's the most straightforward part of this case and because it provides potentially a dispositive ground for resolving it. Uh, the district court identified essentially four uh, 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 categories of conduct to support the monopoly maintenance claim. The first was the alleged tying of Internet Explorer to Windows. The second were Microsoft's license agreements with computer manufacturers, whom I will refer to as is conventionally done as OEMs. Uh, the third were Microsoft's dis uh, distribution agreements with internet access providers, whom I will sometimes refer to as IAPs. Uh, and the fourth relates to Microsoft's, Microsoft's development of an implementation of Java technology. Turning first to tying. Uh, Microsoft's inclusion of Internet Explorer technologies in Windows was not anti-competitive for at least two reasons. First, it resulted in improvements to the operating system that benefited consumers. And second, it did not prevent distribution of competing web browsing software. It's well established in the cases that product design decisions cannot be anti-competitive under Section 2 if they result in improvements to the product. If the rule were otherwise, leading firms would be deterred from improving their products for fear that such improvements would lead to charges of acquisition or maintenance of monopoly. Clearly a rule of that nature, which has been systematically rejected by the courts, is contrary to public policy. The second basis for the district court's uh, uh, acceptance of the monopoly maintenance claim relates to Microsoft's OEM licenses. This is again Microsoft's licenses to computer manufacturers. The district court <coughs> found that there were essentially two provisions of these licenses that were anti-competitive. The first is the requirement that OEMs permit the initial startup sequence of Windows to be completed uninterrupted the very first time the PC is turned on. Let me underscore that what is at issue in this dispute is only the very first time the computer is booted up. There is no dispute about subsequent startups. The second feature of Microsoft's OEM licenses that the district court found to be anti-competitive was the requirement that OEMs display the Windows desktop screen after the computer boots. These features of the OEM licenses, I submit, Your Honors, were not anti-competitive for two reasons. First. In refusing to permit OEMs to make unauthorized modifications of Windows, Microsoft is exercising its rights under federal copyright law. As the holder of valid copyrights, Microsoft may bring infringement actions to prevent distributors, in this case the OEMs, from altering its copyrighted operating systems. In fact, two leading cases, the Second Circuit's decision in Gilliam <laughs> and uh, Judge Posner's decision in WGN expressly recognized that federal copyright law enables a copyright holder to prevent unauthorized modifications of copyrighted works. Although a patent... Well, that, that's a bit broad, isn't it? I mean, the Gilliam case 
a good deal narrower proposition because there was a much greater intrusion into the copyrighted work. I think the court said it was mutilated as the Monty Python case, right? That's, cor <coughs> That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, the Gillian <coughs> court said th th that is correct as to the facts. So you're, but you're, you're talking here about any alteration of the desktop screen, correct? That's correct. Including and the removal of an icon. That's correct. Now why would that so mutilate your copyrighted product? I don't think the holding of, uh, I, I don't think the rule of Gillian is as uh, permissive uh, as... Uh, uh, would you agree that there has to be some materiality threshold? No, I don't really. If you read Gilliam, you will see that uh, ju what Judge Lombard so, says... So you're saying that an immaterial change, can, immaterial in every respect, can be legally uh, consequential? I think that I'm saying that the changes that were, are at issue here are clearly material and significant, and that there is no basis in law for holding that even immaterial changes are permissible. What is the... What is there in the record to suggest that this would be a material change? The user interface is the sole feature of the operating system that is exposed to consumers, Microsoft's customers. And our position is that any alteration of the user interface of the product would be material and significant. Well, I'm asking if there's anything in the record, not just your assertion, but any evidence to suggest that it would be material. Is there any evidence about how consumers would be would perceive the screen or would be confused about the source of it or wonder whether they'd gotten the legitimate product or what have you? I believe there is testimony on that subject. I'm Can sorry, you give me any more I can't than that? cite you to a particular <clears throat> provision of the record. What was the finding? What's the finding relevant to this? Yeah. Uh, I am reminded that there is testimony by Mr. Kempen on this subject. Can you, can you See, refer this, me to the finding of the district court that covers this? I'm not sure that the district court addresses this subject because the district, that is to say, this, this subject being materiality and its necessity for a copyright uh, claim. I thought the district court did suggest that there would be no um, impact on consumer perception or that the, there was nothing to substantiate your concern. I, I, think what, I think what the district court said here is that if there were alterations uh, and they had an adverse impact on the quality of the product, that that would be corrected by the market because the market at the OEM level is highly competitive. And I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, but I don't think it quite addresses the question uh, that Your Honor is raising. I did well, want to ask you about... Uh and this goes back to Judge Santel's original question to you. Uh, the district court's finding 228, which you don't challenge, um, says that the, company, the company's restrictions here were not motivated to protect its copyright. Here's what it says. The removal of the icon, et, et cetera, would not have compromised Microsoft's creative expression or interfered with its ability to reap the legitimate value of its ingenuity and investment in developing Windows. Now, you don't challenge that finding. Uh, we have not challenged that finding. Right. So, and since your obligation is, since findings of fact are considered binding on us unless demonstrated to be clearly erroneous, I don't see how you, uh, can uh, can get a reversal on this part of your case? Uh, I think we can get a reversal if, uh, as a matter of law, the as, as a matter of copyright law, the licensees are not permitted to make any changes unless they are authorized to do so by their licenses. So you're back to it being even an immaterial 
change is... Uh... That is our position, but I'd like to point out one other thing, if I may, Your Honor, uh, and that is that the government's theory of this case is that it is important that OEMs be able to make these changes. And so it's a little difficult to see why the crux of the government's case in this area uh, can be accepted without uh, accepting that there is importance to maintaining the integrity of the Windows desktop. I, I, I wanted to make one uh, just final observation in response to a question Judge Ginsburg asked me that I didn't have a, a moment to uh, respond to, and that is if uh, you read the Gilliam case, uh, you will see that although the uh, alterations were significant in that case, and although uh, 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 the court holds uh, by Judge Lombard that minor alterations would have been permissible, Judge Lombard also observes that the license in that case permitted minor alterations. Backing you up just a moment, though, you would, is it your position that you're not challenging the court's relevant findings of fact, the district court's relevant finding of facts on this subject, but saying that as a matter of law, you win anyway because any alteration is uh, a violation. Is that your position? That is correct, Your Honor. So you're not challenging the underlying findings of fact? I, that's, yes, I, th I think I, 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 okay. I answered Judge Tatel on that subject. But uh, to challenge it on the basis of law, uh, what do you do with the district court's reliance on two Supreme Court cases about the intersection between copyright and antitrust law? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not... Well, the district court in his conclusions, uh, if you look at Joint Appendix 2420 and 2421, uh, refers to quotes from Eastman Kodak saying the court has held many times that power granted through some rational legal advantage, such as copyright, can give rise to liability if the seller exploits his dominant position in one market to expand his empire into the next. Um, and then there's another Supreme Court and also Data General from the First Circuit. So isn't that what the district court was focusing on here? Uh, I, I think your, your Honor is correct. That is what the district court was focusing on. But I think that uh, the passage you just referred to uh, is a misreading of those cases, and it certainly is not the reading that has been given more recently in this area by, uh, among other courts, the Federal Circuit. It is true, of course, that patent rights can be misused or copyright rights can be misused if they are extended beyond the field uh, into, uh, to which they are granted. But the question we have before us today is, may the holder of, copy, of a copyright simply exercise the rights granted by the Copyright Act, which is a federal statute, and therefore is entitled to equal weight with the antitrust laws? Now, in the Intel Intergraph uh, case, which was decided last year by the Federal Circuit, the Federal Circuit held squarely that the mere exercise of copyright rights, even if they have uh, impact on competitors, is not actionable under the antitrust laws. Uh, that holding uh, was reaffirmed more recently uh, in, by the Federal Circuit in the ISO uh, I'm sorry, independent service organizations. Yes, no, I appreciate that, but what I'm getting at is since you're not challenging the finding of fact, number 28, about what your focus was here, why is the district court um, legally wrong uh, in its analysis of uh, the intersection between copyright and antitrust law? B because I, I think the district court assumed that Microsoft was asserting some right to use its copyrights beyond the literal scope of Section 106 of the Copyright Act. And we are not doing that. Our position is that 
OEMs are prohibited from copying or making derivative works of Microsoft copyrighted operating systems unless authorized to do so by their license. That is the essence of a copyright right. Mr. Yarosky, let me take you back to some threshold questions to make sure that there's nothing the court's supposed to be agonizing over on your theory of the case, save what you've put in the brief. But, but some of what you're arguing here, I think we're going to assume you're, you're, you're pressing points of greatest concern. Do you have anything that we need worry about a lot on your arguments with respect to market share or the definition of the relevant market? Uh, I think that our position is uh, set out comprehensively uh, in the briefs. Uh, our position on market share is that market share in and of itself is not a significant element here. What's significant is whether the market share has been achieved uh, effortlessly because of control of uh, elements of supply or whether market share has been achieved as a result of relentless, unremitting, and ferocious competition. All right, so that will take us to the conduct questions. What about relevant definition of the relevant market, about which you say some things? Are there any things you think are important that we ought to know now? Uh, I think the position, again, is set forth in the brief, but uh, in very summary form, uh, there is a, a, a great uh, and uh, not benign contradiction underlying the government's case. On the one hand, the theory of liability is that the most significant forms of competition confronting the Windows operating system are non-operating system uh, software technologies. They're looking to victims in the middleware or alleged middleware market, and you're saying that's excluded from the definition of the relevant market. Right? Precisely. That what? is ironic, but so what? I, I what do we do with it? Forgetting the, the, the causation questions, what do we do with it with respect to the definition of the relevant market, other than observe that it's ironic? Uh, I think that we need to take the next step. Uh, and say that essentially the theory of liability impeaches the market definition. The purpose of defining a market is to identify the locus of effective competition. All right, well, let's assume that we changed the market definition and included uh, uh, the middleware or alleged middleware group, uh, the, the prospective platform that we're arguing about, and we even included uh, a Mac. What happens to your theory of the case? How does that change our analysis in any important way? Uh, I think what it then tells you is that the court cannot rely on a structural analysis to establish market power because now we have no idea of what market shares any of these participants have. And because in this case there is a extraordinary, extraordinary heterogeneity to the, to the participants who are competing to be successful software platforms. Being a successful software platform is a very desirable thing. That's why so many of these companies are investing so heavily in this area of technology. Well, let, let me be more pointed. To, to, to see whether we move on or there's something that I should worry about here. You make the claim that the definition of the relevant market is incorrect. Yes, Your Honor. Let's assume we agree with you it is incorrect. If you were writing the opinion, you would say, and therefore what? I would say, and therefore, the district court's determination as to monopoly power cannot stand because there's no analysis of all of the elements that ought to be included in the market, which are constraints on Microsoft's well, there's behavior. There's an irony in your argument as well, because while you want the middleware included in the relevant market, you allow, as we all must, that it is only a hope. It is not an existing market at this point. 
And then that brings us... That isn't going to change the analysis very much. And if you add Mac in, you still have a share that's in the 80s. With great respect, Your Honor, I don't agree with that. Which? I don't agree with the part about the inclusion of other technologies in the marketplace not having an impact on the analysis. All right, well, then tell me how. Because in this business, even a, even a competitor who has not achieved mass market success and query whether some of these technologies have already achieved what borders on mass market success. I'm thinking uh, uh, particularly at this point of Linux, certainly Apple, uh, and, uh, and uh, Java as well. But even without achieving mass market success, because of the economics of the business, they represent incredible threats and the reason they rep and incredible threats and consequently incredible constraints on behavior, on pricing behavior, on research and development, on uh, the initiation of new products. I, th and I think one could agree with you that they, they represent constraints without uh, saying that they uh, are severe enough to refute the claim of market power. The, uh, I mean, surely Microsoft does have a certain amount of freedom to choose its prices, right? I'm not sure that that makes it all that different from most other leading software makers in their particular field, but it does have that. There's no question that like almost every other supplier of a successful software product or any other intellectual property product, Microsoft has some market power and some, some discretion in pricing, but that is not equivalent to monopoly power. Uh, I, I, I might respectfully invite the court's attention to the monopoly power analysis uh, that was undertaken by both sides in the district court, the monopoly pricing analysis that was undertaken by both sides in the district court uh, in which each side computed a short-term profit-maximizing price for Windows based on the assumptions that one, Microsoft had monopoly power, and two, that it was protected by substantial barriers to entry. In the case of Microsoft's expert, Dean Schmalenzi, he concluded that the monopoly price for Windows ought to be $900 a copy as opposed to the less than $65 a copy that's actually charged to OEMs. The government expert replicated the exercise, accepted the methodology. He made different assumptions, and he got the price down to, he said, within a couple of hundred dollars of the actual price. Mr. Dorowski, may I ask you? The does this all come down to a question of technology? The, the fact of the matter is that, that uh, Navigator was not a competitor with Windows. Navigator was at most a potential competitor. That's that correct, right? and, and And how close it was, how probable it was that it would become a competitor depended upon predicting technological developments. Isn't that right? That's correct. And technological developments really don't depend upon what Navigator's market share was. That's correct, John. It, it may depend upon a deep pocket, but once the acquisition took place of, Nav of Netscape by AOL, there can be no claim that there's not a sufficiently deep pocket. I agree with that, Your Honor. The and, and in fact, you, your claim, as I understand it, is that because the district court specifically found that there was insufficient evidence to demonstrate that that Navigator would compete with Windows, that the uh, monopolization, monopoly maintenance claim has to fall. That's correct. On because you could exclude Navigator from, from the world, and it wouldn't, uh, that doesn't help you maintain the monopoly in Windows because Navigator was not a competitor. That's precisely correct, Your Honor. Yeah. If I might just follow up uh, for a so moment. Wait, wait, wait. Let's finish, finish the discussion on this. The, the, um, does antitrust law not contemplate the possibility that we will protect nascent uh, uh, seedlings of competition? 
Indeed, there's no doubt it, uh, there are lots of ironies in this case. It's uh, 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 your client uh, is shooting at that which you just described as a non-existent non uh, uh, market. Uh, there's no doubt that all of your witnesses say the concern here, it was interesting to read the dean's testimony, the concern here is not about the traditional operating systems. The concern is about this middleware, Netscape, Java in combination. Uh, do we not protect those possibilities if they're reasonable possibilities? I think clearly the antitrust laws protects them, but it doesn't protect them from competition. What's it does protect them from predatory conduct. It protects them from exclusionary conduct. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to make just one observation of, about uh, why uh, competitors like Netscape or potential competitors like Netscape are so dangerous in this market. You have to understand we're dealing with what comes close to being a pure R&D market. And it's one where once a firm develops a successful product and tests it, it is in a position to supply the entirety of demand. There are no constraints on output. Marginal costs are essentially zero. <coughs> and there are, to some extent, network effects. So. A company like Netscape, founded in 1994, can be, by the middle of 1995, clearly a potentially lethal competitor to Windows because it can supplant its position in the market because of the characteristics of these markets. I want to back you up just a moment to the market definition. That is a factual question also, isn't it? Isn't that a question of fact? Uh, no, Your Honor, I, I don't believe it is. At best, it's a mixed question of fact and law. But it's because, certainly not pure law, is it? Well, I think if you look at this court's decision in the Southern Pacific Communications case, you'll see that the court had no trouble in determining that legal standards were not properly applied and, uh, and correcting market definition. The Eighth Circuit has just done that in Concord Boat. What standard do you say of review is applicable to this market definition question? I think this is a de novo standard of review. De novo? Yes, regarding both the articulation of the legal rule and its application. How can Your it Honor? possibly be de novo? Yeah. The district court gave specific factual reasons for excluding Mac and excluding middleware. Precise factual reasons for doing both. And you challenge neither. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I think that we, we do challenge, as I said uh, uh, earlier, we do challenge a number of findings of fact relating to market definition. Well, like what? I mean, you didn't, with respect to Mac, uh, finding 20 and 21 about the reasons why people wouldn't switch to Mac OS. I don't see you challenging. You have a sentence in your brief which says you don't agree with it, but that's certainly not amount, that doesn't amount to a, a clearly erroneous challenge. The district court said that middleware didn't yet expose enough APIs to, po to present any future possibility of competition, and I don't see you challenging that. I, I, just, I, don't I just don't see ladder. how you can make the argument that this is the definition of the market as a question of law. I just Something as fact-bound as that, it's hard to see how you can treat it as, as a legal question as opposed to a fact-finding. Well, as I said a moment ago, uh, I think that this court in Southern Pacific had no trouble doing that. The Eighth Circuit has had no trouble doing it recently in Concord Boat. Well, there's something Boat. from one of those. That, I don't have those cases in front of me, and I, I don't recall you pointing out in your brief anything that says what you just said. Can you quote us the portion of either of those decisions? I, I, I'm sorry, you're Southern right. Pacific. I, I'm sorry, I don't. To which you're alluding when you say the court had no trouble. Uh, I mean, I, we have your assertion that the court had no trouble doing that, but what is the, the language of the court upon which you rely to reach that assertion? It's the sections of the... This court's decision in Southern Pacific, Your Honor, that deal with market definition. 
Mr. Urowski, I want to come back to the, the series of questions I asked you. Why isn't it sufficient if Microsoft, if, if the executives of Microsoft thought, forget about what the truth is, but thought that Navigator potentially could threaten Windows? If they thought and acted accordingly, why isn't that enough, even if it turns out, as the district court found, that, uh, that at least at this point, uh, Navigator doesn't have enough APIs and, and, and really couldn't compete with the uh, Windows operating system. Why isn't it enough that the intent was there? I, I think if, the, if I think it is enough that if the if Navigator was perceived as a potentially uh, uh, strong competitor against the Windows operating system, that Windows that that Microsoft was entitled to take competitive steps to defeat that competitor in the marketplace. If I may, Your Honor, let's go, let's you, excuse me, another point. I thought you said in this regard that intent is not relevant. I'm sorry? In your brief, I thought you took the position that intent is not relevant. That's what I thought. That is correct. Oh, it's only relevant if it helps you, right? <laughs> no, Your Honor. Well, you, I thought you were I'm quite sorry, clear I, I in your brief in saying that intent is that whatever the government can prove out of your documents about an intent to cut my uh, na navigator off at the knees is irrelevant because it's only objective facts that count here. That's correct. But you just told Judge uh, Randolph the opposite. I, I'm sorry, I may have You told him, I believe, that if your intent is exculpatory, then it's relevant. I, I if your intent is, it shows that you, you genuinely perceive Netscape as a an actual and imminent threat to the OS, then you were uh, entitled to take measures that you wouldn't otherwise be entitled to take. Uh, I, I think what I was, I, I'm, I'm sorry if that's, uh, if that's the Perhaps way Perhaps I'm the only one. If that's the way the answer came out. I, I think what I was trying to point out is that because of the nature of this business, even what prove in the end to be uh, very nascent forms of competition can be perceived as highly dangerous and act as strong constraints on the behavior of market participants, and that therefore it, that is relevant to. Well, you guess the government agrees with the beginning of your statement, except how it says it might act in this case not as a um, uh, warrant for uh, strong measures, but simply as the warrant for a course of conduct that they describe as exclusionary. They, they seem to agree that you perceive this as a, a, a major threat early on, indeed, as I read the record, before Netscape perhaps realized the potential that it had. Is that a fair characterization of, uh, of your client's insight? Uh, I, I think I agree with the early on part. Yeah, early on, and I think before Netscape realized it, and they started, according to the government, therefore saturation bombing Netscape in a way that Netscape couldn't even understand the, the, your motive for, since they didn't see themselves as an OS competitor, uh, unlike, say, Java, the Java effort. Well, I, I, th I think they saw themselves as a competitor. They didn't see themselves a, as an OS competitor. Right, they thought they were in the but browser they, market. They thought right. they were a platform competitor, and that part has proved true. Isn't there, uh, before you sit down, isn't there a great deal of tension between your argument regarding the definition of the relevant market and your argument regarding lack of causation? I mean, you find it ironic, the, given the position the government takes, but aren't isn't your position contradictory? Let me just explain. It, you say that Navigator should have been included in the relevant market. Why? Because it's a potential competitor. And then later you say there was no causation between our actions toward Navigator and the monopoly maintenance. Why? Because Navigator was not a potential competitor. How can those two statements stand? Because, I'm the, because the causation argument is addressed to the district court's determination, which defines the markets as it does, and, and therefore identifies as the relevant form of injury the failure for there to have been new entry into the OS segment. Now, if you change the theory of the case, the causation issue is going to change accordingly. If I may, Your Honors, I'd like to reserve. You're, you're not close yet. How much time did you want to reserve? How much did you reserve? Uh, 20 minutes, and I now have 4 minutes and 23 seconds. Oh, you've been oh, talking for 45 at most. been talking for 45. He's only I think, you're, I think we, the courtroom set the clock incorrectly. 
Sorry, Your Honor. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of time. Well, we, we tried to, we try, I think we tried to make it easier for you, and I think we made it more difficult. No, he's got another 15. Don't go anywhere yet, Mr. Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Could you address the issue of uh, explicit restrictions in contracts, let's say restrictions on the distribution of competing browsers? Well, let's in other words, it, can you explain how that uh, has either pro-competitive effects or, uh, given the, the position of Microsoft, uh, can be seen as having legitimate business purpose? Uh, sure, uh, Your Honor. I, I assume you're referring, uh, at least uh, in the initial, uh, at least in the most the obvious case, is the, the, is the one with AOL, with, uh, the 85 percent rule. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I think that it is uh, true. You, you need to go back and look at what the uh, competitive situation was when that contract was negotiated in 1996. At that time, Netscape enjoyed uh, a user share of some pl something like 80 plus percent uh, by their uh, reckoning. Microsoft uh, had been in the business for about a year and had managed to achieve approximately 5% market penetration, notwithstanding the fact that its technology was part of every copy of Windows 95 installed on a machine. In those circumstances, the courts have recognized that exclusive dis distribution contracts can be distinctly pro-competitive because they propel a competitive product uh, into the marketplace uh, and serve to deconcentrate the market, which is precisely what happened here. Uh, with prices falling to zero... It doesn't turn in part on what the, the purpose Microsoft has in, uh, in increasing the use of IE. If, if, the, if its goal in increasing the use of IE uh, is primarily to deflate the middleware prospect of Navigator and Java, which for a substantial period was carried out with it, um, doesn't that begin to look uh, like monopoly maintenance? Uh I think the issue is whether Java and, uh, and Navigator were perceived as being direct platform competitors against Windows. If that is correct, then Microsoft was entitled to adapt the Windows platform and seek to uh, secure as widespread uh, distribution of technologies that were part of the Windows platform um, it, in order it might, to it might compete. be entitled to so long pursue as widespread distribution without using every possible means to secure that distribution. So right. long as Netscape had complete access to the marketplace. Well, you say complete, and then you, you speak many times of the 160 million copies, but uh, can't we draw a distinction between better and worse access? The district court found that Netscape had access literally to, quote, every PC user worldwide to offer Navigator to them. That's just because you could download it? I mean, is that... Because you can download it, because you can distribute through the retail channel. The district court was wrong in considering any transaction costs involved. I think the... I think the answer to that is yes, but there is no showing in this record that the that uh, if there were any increases in distribution costs, that they were significant. May what about I just the bottom line statistic and who has what share of the market? Your Honor, it is undisputed in this record that Netscape's entire marketing budget for 1998 was under $10 million for marketing Navigator, NetCenter, and everything else. Defendants Exhibit 2440.
Do we worry about the uh, convenience for the consumer, forgetting Netscape's budgeting? There is no evidence that there is no evidence. It's not easier for me to have Netscape on the screen when I boot up the second time and choose between IE and Netscape than to have to go onto the internet and download. And that was perfectly possible. Netscape could have gone to the OEMs the way AOL did and secured complete or virtually complete presence on the Windows desktop the first time Your Honor booted up. I thought there was testimony that indicated that, that, that the OEMs wouldn't, wouldn't want that because they put, right. if they put two uh, browsers on, the, uh, on their original equipment, they'll get more service calls. And if they get more service calls, they get more than three service calls, their profit margin is such that they'd, <coughs> they'd be only break even or, or lose. There is, it, wasn't there evidence to that effect? I would, there is a scrap of evidence Actually, in the finding. record on that finding. subject. There's a finding by the district court. There is also undisputed evidence in the record that Netscape was being shipped by such unknown companies as IBM, uh, Gateway, yeah, but Sony. Mr. This, 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 this is a good example. This is a good example. Yeah. yeah. This is an excellent example of the standard review problem. You can point to evidence that supports your view of this case, but there is evidence that supports the district court's finding. I don't mean to beat a dead horse on this, but this is an appeals court, and it's a horse we need to beat. Um, it's the only kind we ever got. <laughs> this is it. I mean, this is our standard of review, and you're, you've made a very powerful argument about your view of the facts, but this, we're not a district court. I had the strong sense you thought we were a jury when I was reading your discussion of factual findings in the brief in which you really, if you have a discussion, the standard of review, it's well hidden, but you lay forth what the evidence is in your view, and I don't see now when you say there's a scrap of evidence, that scrap underlies a finding. How is that finding clearly erroneous under the standard of review we have to apply? Well, there is... I think I was trying to address Chief Judge Edwards' question about convenience. Uh, and uh, if uh, there is a finding that it was, that there were uh, impediments to securing uh, OEM uh, distribution, I won't challenge that, but I do point out that the evidence is undisputed that OEMs, including major OEMs, uh, were distributing Navigator on the desktop, and there is also evidence that, if, and the evidence and the, a finding by the district court that in the case of Compaq, which was n not featuring Navigator until the time of trial, that the payment of a relatively paltry sum, which was not even paid in cash, but through barter advertising, put Navigator on the Presario line of Compaq computers, which is one of the What about the ad remove problem? What, what non-predatory purpose did Microsoft have in setting up a system that would not allow, and, and, and I don't want your answer to focus me on the integration of the other browser functions in the operating system. I fully understand what you did, why you did it, makes good sense. I'll concede that starting out, okay? That isn't my question. My question is very simple. Why take the action that you did, which was inconsistent from your original position, which would allow a consumer to invoke, add, remove, and disable access to Internet Explorer. Uh, well, a consumer can do that. You can just take the icon and uh, move it to the trash receptacle on the desktop. On the add remove? The add remove is a more complicated, uh, uh, technically complicated. Not really. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, I'm not buying that one for a minute. It's not technically complicated at all. Well, all right. If you go to look at uh, OSR, Two, which is the first uh, uh, update of the Windows uh, operating system uh, with IE3 in it. it. IE3 was not 
removable by the ad remove utility right. because the ad remove utility is primarily concerned with new features that are put on the operating system after it's been elevated to a new baseline, which OSR2 was. Now, if you download an update of IE3 onto OSR2, you can run the add you remove utility because that's being added onto what is the new baseline. Microsoft periodically incorporates interim updates in the operating system into a new baseline version that it can describe to developers so that they know what's in the operating system and can make use of the features. That's basically the, the reason, apart from the technical reason that Your Honor adverted to I think at one the of outset. your principal witnesses acknowledged that that decision that you made, that the company made, to limit that capability of the consumer was questionable. And that's why I'm asking the question, what sense did it make? It certainly looks predatory as opposed to, I, I still don't understand your answer to explain why it was a good pro-competitive move as opposed to a predatory move. Because, although the- In other words, it's the simplest thing in the world. I understand what you're saying is a technical matter, but the answer is, and you should know this, and I'm sure you do, the, the answer is, and this is what the government is going to say, beyond what you've just said, it was the simplest thing in the world for Microsoft, especially when you're under pressure and you realize people are getting angry, including the OEMs, to leave the possibility there without regard to whether it's an upgrade or not. And the district court, it seems to me, is saying over and over again, it made no sense. And it looks predatory. And I was wondering if you had some explanation to, to show me how it really was competitive or pro-competitive, because I can't figure that one out. Well, I think it's pro-competitive in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, it's making the functionality available to the user. If the user doesn't want to use it, he doesn't have to use it. Second, it's elevating the baseline functionality of the operating system to a new level so that developers can rely on the essential componentry being there when they develop uh, their uh, 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 applications. And why not let the and, OEMs remove it? And third, it doesn't exclude other rival suppliers. Why not let the OEMs remove it? Because the OEMs are not Microsoft's real customers. End users are. And they generally, like other distributors... You don't have OEMs, you're out of business. You're, you're not handing anything to the... Uh, you've got to go through the OEMs. Is that a question? It has been in the past, Your Honor. Interesting. Mr. Urowski, if, if I take uh, 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 Explorer and throw it into the trash Wait. bin, the, uh, dump it in there, just move the icon and dump it in there. If I, if I violated your copyright... No, because the end-user <laughs> copyright license permits that. The OEM license does not. Let me ask you, Judge Williams was asking you about these agreements, and the district court found that as to uh, the OEM uh, conditions that you had offered certain pro-competitive uh, explanations, and he, for one reason or another, discounted them. But as to the ISV agreements, the district court found that you put forward no pro-competitive business ends whatsoever. Um, is that a clearly erroneous uh, finding or... Uh, Clear, clear error? Well, I, I, think it's, uh, I, I think it's clear error. You said ISP. ISV is in Victor. Oh, the ISV. Uh, I, I don't What think was your evidence of a pro-competitive end? The, an effort was made to secure, to, to really to do two things. One, secure distribution of the underlying IE technology through uh, uh, ISV products through developers' applications products, and two, to ensure that where those products were sold to the installed base, which may consist of users who don't have machines that have been upgraded in the operating system to the level where the application can perform properly, uh, uh, that the ISV distributes the components in order to ensure that the application uh, is properly supported by the operating system. 
Dr. Grosky. Um, you, you've, in response to a number of, of specific <clears throat> claims by the government against various um, contractual relations and terms and so on, the, the uh, OEM licensing, the uh, IAP uh, bounties, uh, the ISV relationship you were just addressing. In each case, you, you give us um, reasons that relate to the promotion of, um, of the sale uh, and enrichment of the Windows product. What is Microsoft's interest, though, not in, in just the sale of units of Windows and of IE, but in, in subsequent usage of IE. Why did you take steps to encourage the usage of IE to the exclusion of alternative browsers? Well, I don't know that Microsoft did or even could uh, exclude users from using alternative products that are available to them. Well, you but had arrangements by which IAPs and ISVs were to put i.e. front and center in order to encourage usage. Yes. Why? Because... What was your interest in usage other than the government's dark explanation? The, uh, the, uh, our, uh, Microsoft's interest in increasing usage is to w make the technologies popular so that developers of applications will recognize that users know about these technologies, recognize that they're on the machines, uh, uh, and develop applications that exploit the technology. By, by that you mean to say applications, applications that use the browser? Correct. But that still doesn't tell me why you want it used. Because the more that end users engage and use Microsoft's technologies, the more developers are interested in exploiting those technologies in their applications. And are there those opportunities to exploit applications, uh, for, for applications to exploit the availability of Internet Explorer that are lost if the user is on Navigator? Uh, I don't know if they're lost if the user is on Navigator. But if the IE technologies are viewed as marginal and Navigator is viewed as the standard for browsing the World Wide Web, then it's likely that standards will evolve in directions that will make it impossible for Microsoft to secure the dedication of developers to exploit the underlying technology. And is it your view or your premise here that one or another of these <clears throat> browser platforms will become a standard, that there is not a stable equilibrium in which there are two or three products with significant market share? No, I think it's our position now that the standards are open standards. And that... Did you say now? Yes. What about during the time the record was compiled? I think at, th at that time, the st those standards were open standards. The only you described Netscape having 80% of the market space, right? And your attempt to dislodge it to at least that extent, relegating it to 20, um, which together with your statement about the need for a standard that encourages applications development su suggests that there's going to be one standard or another, and the only question is which one. Well, I think what... Which may put some irony into the government's right. position if we're going to have a monopoly either way. Right. Well, the, the, the danger in 1995 uh, and early 96 was that Netscape would essentially develop proprietary standards for browsing. That danger was eliminated when it became clear that Netscape was not going to be the sole mass market purveyor of browsing technology. The standards are now open standards, and there's every likelihood they'll remain that way. Uh, if, if I may, I'd like to save a few minutes for rebuttal. Let me just uh, ask you one uh, question, which I promise you has nothing to do with the standard review, and it has to do with... Uh, the high performance, the issues surrounding the high performance JVM. Yes, Your Honor. Um, the, your position, Microsoft's position is that 
that, that Microsoft improved the product by making it faster, right? I'm sorry. I, I, you, 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 that you improved, that Microsoft's changes to Java's, um, uh, to the JVM, it made, made it operate faster on Windows, uh, right? That's not exactly right. Microsoft didn't change somebody else's product. I understand that, but the modifications you made in how software writers use it, right, made it faster. Is that, am, am I wrong about that? I, 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 I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Microsoft built a JVM that was, by all accounts, the fastest and most accurate JVM available in the market. Okay. It also, and I think this may be what Your Honor is referring to, developed technology called JDirect that permitted applications writers not only to write in Java, right. but also to call the operate the Active. the underlying Active. operating system. And the yes, court, yeah, the district court found that that reduced the portability of the system. Yes, he, the district court also found that it was faster and it was easier for developers to use. And that's my question. Are we to disregard the disadvantage that the district court found, uh, or is it your position that those that the lack of portability didn't occur? I think our position is that so long as Microsoft was competing in ways that improved technology and gave developers greater choices, if it impeded, in some respects, the porting of uh, applications from one operating from one operating system to another, that that is irrelevant. That was Sun's. That was Sun's responsibility. But you, you don't make an argument that the development of these key words that were Microsoft, that differentiated Microsoft's JVM from others, uh, increased speed. The, the key words were in the tools, not in the JVM. Well, and, the, right. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the key words were an aid to developers who wanted to make native calls on the Windows operating system, notwithstanding that they were writing in Java. George, well, they would aid if they, if they knew about them. If they, let's say if they knew about this, the difference between what Microsoft was offering and the, stand, the other product. That's correct. They are professional developers. And they, there is no evidence in the record that any professional developer was ever misled by it. Yeah, and it would be is, a very dumb developer who would have been. The question is, were those modifications in the tools necessary to improving, uh, to, to, to the improvements that the record reflects? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. <laughs> because it permitted, you know, everybody speaks about... Java as though this is the second coming of technology. If Java were such a splendid vehicle for writing cross-platform applications, that there would be no... Getting to an answer to this question, what you're now saying, I, why was that necessary to the improvements? Because there is, you can't write full-featured, and the district court found this, you can't write sophisticated, full-featured applications using the range of support provided by the Java class libraries. That's why the developers are making these direct calls on the operating system. And by providing them a way to do that quickly and easily, you're letting them bring their applications to market more quickly. Is, it, is there something asking? in the record that shows that these keywords made things quicker than otherwise? Because I didn't see that. Uh, we'll give you, we'll give think, you a break. You okay, can, you can uh, Mr. Urowski, before you sit down. <laughs> Earlier, a few I moments ago. I thought I was just the opening act. <laughs> if you do a good job, you get to play again. It's like, it's like, it's like pinball. Yeah. Um, a few minutes ago, if I, I want to make sure I understood your, your answer. Uh, I asked you about the company's interest in encouraging usage of the, of IE. And you said that by making it uh, pervasive, uh, ubiquitous, what have you, widespread, uh, it would be an encouragement, if I understood you, to software developers to write applications that would exploit some advantages unique to IE. Is that correct? That's correct. How is that different than 
what, what are you saying different than the government is saying when it describes the same activity as your attempt to bolster the, what it calls, the application's barrier to entry? Well, this is a very big question, but there is no doubt that Microsoft makes heroic efforts to encourage applications writers to write to the Windows platform and competes with other platforms in that regard in the way Your Honor adverted to and in many, many other ways that are far more significant. And the, this is a competitive fact of life in the platforms business. Every successful platform developer must do this. It is a form of competition. If I may take it. Hmm? The court will take 10 minute recess. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. My name is Jeffrey Manier, and I will speak on behalf of the appellees for this portion of the argument. The United States and numerous individual states sued Microsoft because the company used its monopoly power to stifle the competitive process. The government specifically proved that Microsoft violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act through a campaign of anti-competitive acts to protect its operating system monopoly. Microsoft took extraordinary steps and spent extraordinary revenue to prevent consumers from selecting certain innovative technologies, such as Navigator and Java, that in time could weaken the application's barrier to entry that protected the operating system's monopoly. How much did they spend? The expenditures for IE itself were on the order of $100 million well, a year. Well, that's for development, though. Yes. But there's also nothing wrong with that, was there? You're not, you're not challenging that aspect of their No, job. we aren't, but it well, should be remembered. You said they spent extraordinary sums apart from that $100 million. What did they spend? They also spent $30 million a year on average in marketing for a product that they were giving away for free. Yeah. And we think that that is significant. Now, Microsoft's own documents demonstrate that it took the steps, the anti-competitive ste steps that I will speak of later, to protect its Windows monopoly. The government did not dream up this theory. We found it in the government's, in, the, in Microsoft's documents. And those documents laid out the business strategy for protecting the monopoly and maintaining it through anti-competitive acts. Mr. Manier, is there any case in which the relevant include the substitute service that is the alleged victim of the predatory conduct? Your I Honor, can't find any. No, Your Honor, I think that that does not characterize correctly the government's case. The government uh, views middleware as a threat to the operating system monopoly because it, provide, it makes other operating systems a better substitute for the Windows operating system. That is the way in which the middleware would erode the application. It's not the way your brief's entry. written. I mean, I was, I, I mean, I'm deadly serious. I went over this over and over again. I think you're going to hear a lot of questions on the, 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 irony, the ironies in the theory, but that is not the way your brief is written. You, you conclude having pointed to the predatory, the alleged predatory conduct by saying, and the destructive effects here were to the middleware market. There is never a reference to Linux, to BIOS, to any of the other operating systems. There's a dramatic shift. Uh, you talk about operating systems starting off, but your premise is not that Microsoft has destroyed those possibilities, but rather that Microsoft has d destroyed a nascent possibility. Your Honor, with respect, I believe that our brief makes the point that, uh, the point that I just made, namely that middleware posed a threat because if it were widely introduced and widely adopted, it could be ported to a number of operating systems. Right. And, and, eventually, fact, and eventually make the operating systems relatively insignificant. Yes, and make them, actually make them better competitors. No, make them relatively insignificant because the principle, the substantive work that the operating system does would be taken over by the middleware. That's your whole theory. Only a port the, the And indeed, if you were relying on Microsoft's papers, that is certainly what the dean argues. Uh, that was the threat that Microsoft contemplated. That is, that middleware would virtually wipe out 
anything of great import that operating systems uh, now offer, substantively. They would be there, but not nearly as important. Your so Honor, let me, I still want to come back yes. to my question. Yes, Your Honor. Assume I'm right, okay? I understand you're going to argue your case. I'd still like to know, is there any case that you can point me to in which the relevant market is defined to exclude the substitute service that's the alleged victim of the predatory conduct? Your Honor, I think that I cannot point to a particular case, but I, th I think it certainly is reasonable to see why that could be that this situation can arise, particularly when the threat itself is quite nascent and does not yet pose a threat to, uh, in the relevant market to the product at issue. Again, I'd like to emphasize, though, that uh, our, th our theory is different, and we believe our theory is reflected in the district court's findings and the district, district court's conclusions. I think the district court was quite clear as to this point, that the threat that Microsoft's, uh, that Navigator posed was to make other operating systems competitive with Windows. That would, in effect, in Mr. Gates' words, commoditize the operating systems. And lead to a, a diminution or a, a erosion of the application's barrier to entry that had sustained the, the Microsoft operating system monopoly. Can you address Mr. Urowski's uh, really last point, which was that, um, yes, indeed, Microsoft was trying to, as he says it, stimulate uh, software producers to, uh, to use its platform. Now, I take it that uh, any competitor in the in the platforms market would have to do that, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, uh, so that must be done. That, uh, that is part of the competition for the platform market. Your Honor, our brief makes clear that we have no objection to Microsoft's broad distribution of its product, its development of IE. Uh, those are part of the competitive process well, which you we do, favor. You, you, you do say that the uh, the OEMs have to have, under antitrust law, the right not to include uh, IE, although it's unclear how much of IE they have a right not to include. Well, Your Honor, our, our view with regard to the OEMs is, again, as stated in the district court's factual findings. The OEMs found that it was not profitable and contrary to consumer interests to provide, uh, to deny consumers a choice of browsers. Consumers wanted a choice of browsers, and they wanted to provide I'm sorry, them to why, them. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't having both browsers on the machine be a choice of browsers? The problem was, as the OEMs knew, is that this was confusing to the individual consumer. It increased their support costs, three support costs, and they could lose the profit on any given well, machine. You, and they also you, had to you're engage. Ar you're arguing that this was the, the creation of an artificial, and I take it serious, barrier. Uh, and on that point, doesn't the uncontradicted testimony that 10 OEMs included both, uh, and Mr. Barksdale's testimony that uh, Netscape was completely interoperable with uh, Windows, where Windows had IE, doesn't that undermine that position? The district court credited the testimony of, of others that indicated that there was consumer confusion. And this came from both the OEMs is, themselves. Is there, is there measurement of the scale of consumer confusion? No, but I, I believe... Mean, it, I mean, lot, there are an awful lot of people who have both right on their computer. Yes, right? but nevertheless, the OEMs, who are very close to the customers, they are the ones who receive the support calls, viewed this as a real problem. They complained to Microsoft about this. And there was no good reason not to provide that. Well, but, but in a sense, you, you and Mr. Tarkowski agree that there was a reason, namely to stimulate uh, software programmers to program in whichever it is, either Java or uh, Windows. Well, I'd like to pause to look at that, that question of uh, motive. <coughs> Uh, motivating developers to provide applications. Those developers would be providing those applications whether Navigator was on the system or whether IE is on the system. And instead, in our view, there ought to be competition on the merits between those two browsers. And that is what Microsoft's actions were for closing. To have a cross-platform middleware, you envision having a competitive situation? 
No, there would we be, felt... Of course not. We're going to replace one monopoly with another if you're right, right? That's what Judge Ginsburg was suggesting. Your Honor, the, the question is, we don't know if this is a winner take all No, but I mean, take your theory all the way through. That's what this case ultimately is about, is whether or not the Microsoft, the alleged Microsoft monopoly, should be replaced by what you say over and over in your brief, uh, should be the Netscape Sun combination together middleware monopoly. It would have to be a monopoly because you can't compete to offer that which you envision them offering, right? Judge Edwards, I disagree with your characterization of what this case is all about. It's all about allowing the competitive process to determine who will be the winner in the market. But the winner, uh, we're not disagreeing so far. The winner will be a monopoly, right? We, can, we do not know that. I think we have to allow the, the market to determine that. It's but you don't seriously assume that you have com a competing middleware, uh, uh, competing middleware operations, do you? I can't say that it, it's inconceivable that a situation could arise where there would be okay. well, 50 you, you percent haven't users. argued that. Let's put it that way. You haven't argued that. The no. end result is not going to be a competing. A number of folks will say, here we are, consumers. We're all competing as the middleware uh, operation. Choose one. We haven't argued an end result one way or the other. Oh, when you prepare a case like this, believe me, you think about every piece including the end result and there is some irony maybe it's not an irony maybe in this business because of its dynamic nature what we're what we're going to see from here on in is competition who's going to be the next monopoly and what the form will be maybe that's what we're doing let me let me ask you about some questions in causation if i will because that's what's really bothering me yes, about right. your theory uh professor arita and a number of others say that that impermissible exclusionary uh, behavior is conduct other than competition on the merits that reasonably appears capable of making a significant contribution to maintaining the monopoly, right? That's correct, okay. yes. So there's got to be a causal connection between the conduct and the maintenance of the monopoly, right? Yes. Okay. So a monopolist cannot be seen to advance monopoly power by destroying something that doesn't reasonably threaten the monopoly, right? I disagree there. The monopolist can, in fact, be seen as destroying competition if he correctly perceives that this is a threat. I said will doesn't emerge. reasonably threaten the monopoly. But if it will, it doesn't it. reasonably. It's not reasonable for anyone to assume that this threatens a monopoly. That's all I'm asking the question. Here. No trick yet. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is that so now let me is that let an me... objective test that Judge Edwards just stated is an objective test, isn't it? Yes, based on since it's a reasonable, a reasonable threat. Yes. Right. Now, if an institution uh, is not a threat because it has neither the interest nor the capacity to challenge the monopoly, uh, what do we say about that? Is that is that a reasonable threat? I'm afraid I don't understand. Could you repeat uh, let's that? Say, let's me, let's, Honor, let's, let's, let's say, for example, um, Microsoft whimsically uh, uh, has a thing about a grocery chain. They don't like them. They got a lot of power. They got a lot of friends in society, and they they use their connections to destroy the advertising possibilities for this grocery train tr uh, uh, chain, which goes under. Okay, yes. they use lots of means. That's not going to be a, a Sherman Act uh, Section Two problem, is it? Well, well, no, it isn't, because they do not have monopoly power in the grocery market. Exactly. Okay. So then, if we're looking at, that's my point. If we're looking at an institution that is not reasonably going to compete with. Microsoft in this middleware area, we won't worry about it, right? The gross, for example, the grocery store. For the grocery store, store yes, under okay. your now, hypothetical. Now, here's, here's some of what's in the record that's worrying me with those concessions in mind. Mr. Barksdale says he was unequivocal in saying that Netscape never maintained any seri in any serious way that Navigator was a substitute even for the platform characteristics of Windows. Let me just give you my scenario. Yes, Your Honor. The dean was unequivocal in, say, in testifying that Netscape never sought to achieve middleware status to be a viable competitor to the Windows operating system. The district court found there wasn't enough evidence to uh, say that this could ever happen. Uh, certainly not Netscape alone, but they were focused on Netscape and Java because that's the way you're presenting the case. Netscape itself did not act to become a viable platform. For example, it never developed the componentized version of the browser. Uh, Netscape, the testimony is clear that Netscape currently enjoys sufficient usage to share, a usage share to offer the ISVs a viable platform, and yet they haven't done it. Um, 
and there are problems in the connection between Netscape and Sun. Uh, they have not put all of what Sun needs in order to be able to distribute that which Sun would need to be a viable platform. Now, your whole theory of the case is not that Netscape alone is going to be the middleware platform, but that Netscape and Sun together. There is no doubt in my mind that Sun has the capacity, based on everything I see, to be in the middleware business. But you argue the case very clearly that it must be Netscape, the, Netscape, the carrier, and Sun together. And I went back and checked it again. Now, if I'm right in looking at this record, that Netscape, Netscape neither has the interest nor has done anything to facilitate the possibility, what's different from Netscape in the grocery store? Your Honor, I don't. I think that the the facts that you've chosen from the record, or the evidence you've chosen from the record, don't correctly capture the factual findings of the district court or the government's theory of the case. Well, the district court on the possibility was clear. The district court said he couldn't make any findings. The district court said he could not conclude that Netscape and Sun together would achieve the status that you're envisioning. It said that it could not ultimately achieve that status, but I think the district court was also quite clear that Microsoft's steps prevented competition in the market that could have led to that but result. But if it's a grocery store, what difference does it make? If we have a paranoid monopolist who shoots at anything, whether it's viable or not. The crucial difference, Your Honor, is that the grocery store threat uh, poses no threat to Microsoft's monopoly. Well, and what I'm suggesting to you is, and you have to tell me where the record is different, because I've looked at this over and over and over again. Your argument is you must have Netscape and Sun together. I can't find anything of import in the record to su suggest that Netscape has an interest in or capacity to serve in the plat middleware platform market. Your Honor, I think that the evidence, uh, I cannot cite you to particular evidence except to say that I believe that there is a mixture of evidence with regard to Netscape's uh, plans, and expectations, and certainly Microsoft... I do better than that. I mean, th we've heard a lot up to now about the facts and findings and, and uh, how we're supposed to defer to them. I'm, I'm speaking to you very directly now. I'm telling you I can't find it, that I've poured through the record. I found one statement early on where someone in Netscape said, you know, we're going we're gonna to take over the world. But then Barksdale is very clear in his testimony that Netscape was not intending to not designed to enter this middleware market. That's not what it was about. Now, where's the counter evidence? Where are the findings that you can rest on to show me we have something other than a grocery store? Your Honor, I, I have to dis disagree with your characterization of Mr. Barksdale's testimony. I read, I believe. I just read his words. Yes, but I believe his words indicate that they were not going to compete with Windows as an operating system. No, I think I that read that's the what words. he meant. Platform. Didn't say operating system. Your Honor, I think that his, contact, his discussion in context, together with Microsoft's perceptions of what were going to be done, and the discussions that came out of the June 21st Perceptions agreement. can't carry me anywhere I've, on causation, because all that, all that causes me to imagine is the paranoid monopolist. That's someone who gets up, who has ideas way ahead of the rest of the world, and gets up in the middle of the night and shoots at any movement. All right, fine. That doesn't tell me anything that Microsoft saw Netscape as a real threat. What I'm trying to figure out is, did Netscape perceive the possibility, have the capacity to perform, and then do what it could and should have done? And some of these things are fairly easy, like the componentized version of the browser, which they didn't do. They were working on that, however. The record indicates that they were planning to develop such a componentized version for some of the software developers who wanted it. But nothing, to go back to directly... No, nothing that Microsoft... I mean, it, first of all, it, when you talk about perceptions, you agreed with me that the ARETA test, which you're adopting, is an objective test. So it's not going to turn on what Microsoft's perce perceptions were. And, and, and second of all, isn't this... Uh, and I asked the same question of Mr. Yurowski. Isn't this a question not of economics or not of market present, uh, penetration or any of that, but a question of technological development? And, and Judge Edwards is asking you, as I understand it, where is the evidence that Netscape either had the potential or was on the road to technological development to, to, to set up or, or expose APIs sufficient to have applications written so that it would become a platform in competition with Microsoft. And if you don't have that evidence, then how can you possibly say that there's causation here? 
Your Honor, I will point to two pieces of evidence that I think are important. First of all is the combination of Navigator with Java. Right. And second is the fact that when Microsoft approached Netscape to seed the market, what they were seeking was a session of platform capabilities. And Netscape refused to go along with that deal. That doesn't mean that Netscape either had the capacity or interest to do it. I won't give my own take on what I saw in the record. But yes, there's no doubt that Microsoft had a large vision at that point. But there's nothing to indicate that Netscape had the same vision, or if they did, that they intended to act on it. And so that they concluded that meeting by saying, go away, Microsoft, didn't tell me anything. Your Honor, I think we disagree on this point. And I think we do agree, though, however, that Netscape and Java together did pose a threat. If Netscape has the capacity and interest to do what it takes to enter the middleware platform area. Now, if Barksdale says, no, that's not what we're going to do, the Microsoft testimony through the dean says they're not doing anything to ready themselves for the platform. And the evidence shows that there are serious technical problems in the connection between Netscape and Java, the combination that you're relying on. I don't know what that shows us on causation. But, Your Honor, that connection that you're talking about between Navigator and Java, the problems there, there's no doubt. I think there is testimony in the record from Dr. Gosling that Navigator and Java were working together to try and develop cross-platform capabilities. Now, Netscape fell behind in certain respects, but that was primarily because it had had its air supply cut off, to use the terms that were used in the record. Where's the record evidence on that? Where's the facts? Where are the facts on that, that they could not, for example, componentize, they could not write the right script for Java because of things that Microsoft was doing? Where are the findings? A specific example of that is the finding of the district court that Netscape had discontinued the development of a JNI, even though it was useful for the Java implementation. That was another point I was going to raise with you. Go ahead. Because they did not have the funding that was necessary to continue the work because of the competitive pressure that they were under. Remember, Netscape's business model was to, originally, to sell their browser. And they had to change their model when Microsoft offered its browser for free. And that cut back on the revenues that they had for certain types of development. What is Sun's model? Because Java is always depicted as this cross-platform technology, which will commoditize the operating system. How is Sun going to make money? I mean, if it puts it out there for free, then obviously we're in a wonderful world where they, where this, call it generally the platform monopoly is disposed of. But if it's going to simply be the successor of Microsoft, I'm not sure what exactly the function of the suit is. I believe that Java licenses its Java programming language and its JVM, so it does receive revenues from that. Developers are free to use it. And the more developers use it, the more money it makes, right? Yes, the more developers that use it, the more widely it's distributed, the more money that Java makes. So then it does become the new monster, right? It could potentially. All of these were potential threats. Why not? I mean, isn't that really the government's theory? I mean, the government persuaded the district court to make this finding a fact that essentially Netscape needed to become the standard. That's because it needed universality. It needed not to have competition, in effect. Your Honor, I think that what we indicated at trial, that by becoming the standard, not mean that it had to become a monopolist. It simply had to have sufficiently widespread use that applications writers would view it as an alternative to writing to the dominant window. That's not what the district court found. If you look at finding 378, the district court found specifically that Netscape or Navigator had to become the standard. It's just exactly what Judge Williams said. Yes, but by becoming... How do you explain finding 378? By becoming the standard, it did not need to become the only browser. And Microsoft realized that simply by preventing it from having a sufficiently broad usage level, it would not attract applications development. And usage is key here. I think that's something that's important to understand in terms of the anti-competitive acts that Microsoft took to protect its monopoly. 
that as Microsoft itself recognized, that it's usage that determines that's important here, not merely distribution. And the fact that numerous copies of Netscape could have been distributed does not answer the question of whether uh, there was sufficient usage that applications writers would be writing to Netscape and Java as platforms. Suppose, there, suppose that happened and they were writing to that platform. Doesn't it follow from your case about consumer confusion that either Netscape or IE is going to end up as the sole occupant of the desktop? Again, that may happen, but I don't think we can predict the market. The key well, is... Tell us how you think it might not, assuming uh, there isn't... A, we're, all, we're all wondering about this curiosity in this case. It really looks like one monopoly replacing another. We will all ask you the same question in different ways. We can't imagine how you're imagining otherwise. And indeed, your brief seems to, seems to accept that possibility. Is that what we're really talking about? Well, one I monopolist replacing another. Are we fighting for monopoly fighting for the newest, latest monopoly status. Your Honor, my answer again is we don't know, and I'd like to give you two responses to this. Do, you have first. to have a theory as to, first you have a theory as to Microsoft's motivation, and, you, and you, you have sort of implicitly a theory as to what this nascent or embryonic competition was. But unless uh, you, yeah, the, the whole fight for getting programmers to program, it, program in the language, turns, it seems to me, on the notion that uh, you want universality. Your Honor, our theory of the case is this, that, metal, that the middleware was viewed by Microsoft as a, th a threat. Perhaps they realized it even before Netscape did. But in any, any event, they realized it was a threat to their monopoly on operating right. systems. Right. That operating system monopoly is protected by the application's barrier to entry. Right. And they recognized that the way the middleware would threaten that uh, monopoly is by eroding that barrier to entry, right. that it would become popular enough that people would write to that Right, program. and if you write to Java Netscape, your Java Netscape, uh, there would be an applications barrier in the new middleware market. There would have to be. You can't compete reasonably if you want to cross even platform uniformity. That's what we're asking. You can't keep avoiding the question. If that's the answer, say yes. If you're hopelessly confused about it, say that too. But I mean, this really leaps out. I'm serious, this really leaps out, Counselor. Are we talking about monopoly to monopoly? Because you surely don't mean to envision Microsoft competing fairly with Netscape Java and having competing middleware applications that consumers are going to try and sort out? Well, Your Honor, if we assume that this is competition for a monopoly, the fact still remains that that's a form of competition that is subject to Section 2. Well, I, I didn't say it was a bad thing, but you seem to be running from it as if it is. It's, it's curious because we don't normally see it, and it may be the nature of this kind of a market, but it seems to be that that's what you're talking about. I, I apologize, Your Honor. I was simply trying to clarify that I simply can't predict what the market will look like. I think we have to leave that to the market. Well, there was a time, I suppose, when before, <clears throat> when Java first arrived as a concept in which it was tenable to hope that Java would be able to run on any underlying um, Platform is that correct? That's correct. Any underlying OS? Pardon me. Yes. Right. Yes. So that you could have um, coexistence of stable equilibrium with the with Java and Windows uh, coexisting. Yes, and I think okay. an application. But, but, but have, the events seem to have overshadowed that. I mean, Java hasn't realized the potential that was initially perceived, and it starts to look more like a, a potential alternative to Windows rather than a, um, a co-occupant of the desktop. And the reason why that right. potential hasn't been recognized was well, because... Well, I understand part Microsoft. of your theory is that Microsoft assured that it wouldn't uh, yes. come to fruition. Now, so, but, but if, if you take, let's go back to the Edenic days in which people thought these two might coexist um, in the sense that applications would run on either one. What about your theory of consumer confusion on the desktop? Wouldn't there still be only one on any given desktop? Would there be confusion if Java was running on all desktops together with... No, no. With yeah, well, maybe that's where you're going. I'm sorry. If Java and Windows were installed on the same PC desktop, according to the record we have here, one would expect consumer confusion, calls to the OEMs, no profit in it for the OEMs to carry both of them, and only one would ultimately be installed. No, I don't think that's the case, again, Your Honor, because Java, we have to remember the role that the browsers played uh, 
in invoking Java, that the browsers would be installed on the operating system, and the browser would most likely go to a web-based application. Right. It would find a Java applet there, most likely, the full-fledged Java applications but, have been but slow you take, in coming. But take Judge Ginsburg's question. I mean, yes. it, it's, it's the same question. You wouldn't use IE and, and Netscape Java. You'd have to pick one or the other. Yes, I think that's probably true. And so would an OEM. And an OEM would as well. So but what if that's probably true, then you've answered your own prior question that you didn't want to answer, which you said what you said now is there will probably, I think the implication of what you just said now is there will probably emerge a single ubiquitous um, uh, uh, winner in this competition. Well, I, I by no means wish to exclude that possibility. Okay, but that's I want to a possibility, it's, but it's not fatal to your argument by any means, right? That, that's correct. That there needs to be what Sidgwick and then later Dems, it's called competition for the field as opposed to competition within the that's field. That's exactly right. okay. whole argument, though, only, does it only deal with OEMs? I mean, because you still have the IAP no. market out there. Right. Yes, that's Th correct. This argument only deals with OEMs, right? Uh, yes, in a, in a sense, although the IAPs also are forced to select a primary browser of one kind or another, and so I suppose you could say that that, that could arise. Now, the IAPs, I suppose, do have the possibility and actually the preference to offer their users alternative browsers. Right. And uh, so you do have, you can have the situation where, in fact, the consumers are evenly divided between uh, IE and Netscape. And applications writers would act in response to what happens. But what's important is how we get there. Well, uh, yeah, that is exactly the question. That what methods of competition are permissible? Now, it's, it appears to be the government's position that the mere inclusion by Microsoft with its operating system of its browser is ipso facto uh, exclusionary. It is, it is a forbidden form of competition. Now, Mr. Orowski, said, gave, gave an answer as to why it was doing all this, and, and, and his answer covered the other methods of seeking distribution. It was quite different from Dean Schmalency's. Uh, he said it was in order to encourage uh, applications writers to write to Microsoft, to Windows. Uh, I, I take it the, the, new, uh, competitor, the new potential monopolist is also entitled to do things in order to encourage applications writers to write to it. Yes. So which, which are the, how do we draw the line between the permissible and the impermissible? Well, first of it, all, section two applies to the monopolist and the actions a monopolist might be taking. Uh, so we have to, to be clear on that. We still regard have to have a line. Yes. But with regard to what uh, Microsoft was doing with respect to Windows, we have no objection to Microsoft offering IE as part of the Windows package. Where, when, where Microsoft well, crossed but, the line. But, but if one can compete yeah. for applications writers, why isn't uh, Microsoft entitled to, to try to seek usage, right? Yes, it's, the problem here is the way in which they tried okay. to obtain and, the and, usage. And what exactly is it that makes it impermissible? Okay, let me, in the OEM channel, first of all, is this I'm, question... I'm, I'm, I'm put aside explicit exclusion. Yes, Your Honor. First of all, in the OEM channel, I won't dwell on tying since that will be the discussion of this afternoon, but that was one of the methods that they used. But even if you view Windows and IE as a single product, it still was anti-competitive for Microsoft to refuse to allow the OEM to remove IE uh, as it but, easily but, could but have been done on Windows if it's 95. a legitimate business purpose to encourage software writers to write to your system, what, what is uh, Microsoft supposed to do in this context? Microsoft is supposed to allow competition on the merits. Yeah. And that means that the OEMs and the consumers are entitled to have a choice between oh, yeah, the, 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 Navigator the, and IE. The, you're much stronger position on the consumers than on the OEMs, right? But the OEMs, the OEMs do not necessarily have uh, the consumers and Microsoft's interests uh, at heart, or even the, even the pure consumer's interests at heart, right? Yes, they, they have their own issues. But the district court, I think, quite properly found that they're an accurate proxy for consumers. And if we look at particular... Do they, do they have any interest in preventing fragmentation, which consumers do have an interest in? 
Uh, no, well, perhaps they do. They have a, an, an interest in satisfying consumers ultimately. And the most direct well, way that well, they would- why, is, why isn't having consumers able to either delete or more simply ignore uh, a browser uh, quite sufficient? Well, the OEMs were responding- if, and I guess, I guess I would go back to this. If Microsoft is entitled to compete to uh, get writers to write to its system. What Microsoft cannot do is foreclose a competitor from reaching the market through means that are not pro-competitive. That's what I'm trying to find out. Yes. It is pro-competitive for Sun to use methods to get its technology out there and thereby induce applications writers to write to it. What, what methods are permissible for Microsoft to do the same, if any? Microsoft was free to offer its, its browser with IE and allow the, the uh, OEM to make that IE, determination. Right. What they were not free to do was to force the OEM and therefore the consumer to use IE. How does, how does, I, I don't understand how it force, forces the consumer at all. It forces As the, I understand it, the, the government's position is that the uh, inclusion of the four libraries in OE is perfectly okay. The only thing that's fatal in terms of what Microsoft is doing is insisting that iExplore.exe be included. And, and what is it, what is the pro-competitive interest that makes it uh, a matter of antitrust law for Microsoft not to be allowed to get that to the consumer who can then totally ignore it? The problem is the consumer itself, the consumer might not realize that he or she has a choice. And this will occur in the situation, as the OEMs described it, of consumer confusion. They're trying to respond to the consumer demand for Navigator, and they found in response that they were receiving that they had to load IE, if they put IE and Navigator both on the system, that the consumer would be confused, and so that led to a decline is, in the use of... Is that consumer of, confusion quantified in any way? Yeah. It's not, it's described, it's not quantified, but it certainly is described isn't, in the it, testimony. Isn't, isn't there, I mean, if you're imposing on one firm a set of competitive restrictions that you aren't imposing on other firms, how, that is to say, you, you acknowledge the legitimacy of a particular form of competition in general, uh, haven't you got to have a pretty good method for weighing what it, at what point it becomes impermissible? Uh, yes, Your Honor, but I think that the, the case law and common sense and the facts of this case provide direction on these matters. Do, do you have any case that says that a manufacturer cannot uh, define his product and let it get through to the consumers? I'm putting aside tying cases, which we will come to this afternoon. Yes, well, I was going to speak, uh, point out the tying cases, but here let's look to the individual facts. And why is it that the OEM could not invoke the add remove function that was available to the consumer in order to provide the consumer well, to, you, to meet a You and Mr. Orowski are on the same page on that, right? To get, to have it out there, to have it used to encourage applications writers. You're on the same the page, difference. but you, all you disagree is as to what's permissible for whom. But the difference Which is all in our view is here. that we view Microsoft as a monopolist and it protecting well, its, let, its operating system monopoly as but, well. But is, is it your position that with respect to anything that has to do with encouraging applications writers to write to its system, it is, it can do nothing. It, it, can, they say it, can do no, it can incur no cost, which is explicitly aimed at that goal. But we have to, exclusively at that with, goal. With all respect, Your Honor, we have to look to why they are encouraging these, incurring these costs. That IE generated no revenue. And putting yes, IE... But, yes, but I mean... We, <laughs> that's why yes. they're emphasizing the applications. Exactly. The, the encouragement to write applications. But the applications, if Navigator were on Windows rather than IE, those applications would be written to Navigator, and it also would encourage sales of Windows ultimately. So whether you have IE or Navigator makes no effect, has no effect on the revenue-generating yeah, product but, here. Yeah, but it, it does in the long run because it has to do with what applications writers write to, right? That's the theory of your case. 
And the theory of our case is that Microsoft was concerned that if they wrote to Navigator, that would erode the application's barrier to entry. And, and by, the same, token, by the same token, Sun was concerned <laughs> that unless everybody was writing to Java, it would not be established as a cross-platform technology. I don't think right? that, well, first of all, Java, I don't think it had any monopoly power in these situations. So no, we have not, to, a, not, not at the time of trial or now. Yes, and so I think we do have to distinguish the Java situation and the mod motivations yeah, of those we, that are competing. I, I understand that there's a difference between the monopoly preserving his, monopolist preserving his turf and the, uh, the challenger trying to get his turf, but you still are very vague on what methods of competition are permissible. Well, uh, why don't we move on to some of the well, other no, let methods? Me, so I don't that, want to move on because I want to ask you a different... I, I have a concern about just this issue, which is just slightly different from Judge Williams, which is that as I read the district court's findings and conclusions, I, I didn't see the district judge wrestling with this issue. The district judge's findings all seem to focus just on the anti-competitive effects of including IE in Windows. It, there was no uh, sort of counterbalance, no, no consideration, at least I couldn't find it, by the district court of the uh, business justifications for doing it and weighing the two against each other. The reason, Your Honor, is because the court had great difficulty in finding the business justifications when IE was a, not a revenue generating product and well, was this argument that we've heard today not made before the district court? That is, that what, what, when, what Microsoft was doing was trying to encourage software writers to write for it, and that's why it was included in the browser? But I think the response, that argument, that argument was made right in the district court. There's a lot of evidence on it. Yes, but I think that the response that was made to that was that that is not going to increase the sale of Windows. Well, because but, 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 why is that but, defined as the sole legitimate right, exactly, function right. of yeah. Microsoft? And the district court didn't say that anyway, did it? That's you today. Well, th I think the district court did make the point that these, uh, that Microsoft's actions in promoting IE uh, did not generate revenue because IE was not revenue generating. And it also did not encourage the sale of Windows because either IE or Navigator running on Windows would encourage the sale of Windows. How about encouraging the survival or protecting the survival of Windows? Is that not legitimate? I don't think there's ever been any question about Windows No, 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 I'm being deadly here. serious. If you're right about <clears throat> the expectations of this middle, if the middleware notion is a viable notion, and Windows, Windows has been, I mean, Microsoft has been totally out front. I mean, that's what's so funny reading this initially. Depends on how you're looking at this case, what you think. Min uh, Microsoft is totally out front and saying, oh, yeah, we perceive that, that concern. If that thing develops, if that seed is allowed to grow, we're in trouble. Now, our market share as Windows may stay as is until then suddenly we drop dead when Suns becomes the new monopoly. But we're not going to let that happen. And that's what Judge Williams has asked you. What are they supposed to do? If you, were, you said it might be monopoly to monopoly is what we're looking at in these dynamic markets. Well, Windows and Microsoft are allowed to compete for the next stage, right? Yes, they are. Okay, so what Judge Williams keeps asking you is, what are they allowed to do? If the next stage is a monopoly, not just let's bring everybody in and, and all compete fairly, it's a monopoly. They're allowed to compete on the merits of their product, and that is key, that the Sherman Act does not simply uh, turn a blind eye to markets that are destined to become monopolies. Are you, Instead, your position, you've mentioned a number of times that this was not a revenue-generating product for, for Microsoft. Uh, are, is it your position that Microsoft created a barrier to entry in the browser market? The barrier being pretty insurmountable. That is, you, you can't earn a dime if you uh, develop a browser. Well, we haven't made that argument. I mean, that certainly seems that that's, uh, there's some force to what you're suggesting, Your Honor. That would, that uh, would keep all potential browser manufacturers out indefinitely, wouldn't it? I mean, you had to be a fool to get into that market. Well, yes, and in fact, it, you know, an, an argument can be made that, that offering the browser for free was a form of predatory pricing. Now, we are not arguing that here. Good We're reason. even going so far as to say that that's, <laughs> you know, that that is, that is permissible. But what we're concerned about are very specific anti-competitive acts that were detailed by the district court. But, Attorney, you, will, will you articulate for me the line between the permissible and the impermissible. And, and you might, 
You might do this in relation to the Lorraine Journal case, which interestingly is cited in neither the government nor Microsoft's brief. Uh, but that, that is a case of, of leveraging monopoly in one market into another, or at any rate, uh, <coughs> nipping, nipping competition in the bud. Uh, but there you had a clearly uh, exclusive dealing requirement. And here you have a few in the periphery, but, but no one's really exercised about them. Yes, Your Honor, well, I think the Lorraine Journal is highly pertinent. We haven't relied on it. You don't have it. conduct. You don't have conduct like that. Oh, I think that we do. I think we do. What we had in Lorraine Journal was really a reverse tie, that advertisers who wanted to advertise with the right. newspaper could not advertise right. on the radio. Right. And we're seeing conduct of that you same you have, you have, sort. You have a tiny bit that parallels that. Yes. You have the 85% rule with AOL and so forth. For the most part, you have vigorous promotion of IE. Vigorous promotion of a product, again, that is given away for free, which should give the court some concern about the pro-competitive nature yeah, of what's but, going but, on. But, but remember, but, you, you are accepting the proposition that a firm seeking to establish its position in cross-platform technology has a, an imperative interest in getting applications writers to write to it. The question is, how are they to do that? Yes. Uh, wh whether they're on top or on the bottom. We think the district court drew the correct line. That in the case... Where would you say that line is? What is it? In the, because in the, because it's, it clearly goes beyond explicit exclusion, the Lorraine Journal model. Yes, and I, th I would say this, that the line with regard to the OEMs was the failure to allow Navigator to have any prospect for usage, for, for distribution that would lead to usage. It was an exclusion from distribution. And this is where we disagree well, with you Microsoft. Say yeah, but your exclusion from distribution is the inference from the insistence on distribution, right? That is the actual act that Microsoft did, insist on distribution of IE. But to and you say that that inherently excludes, notwithstanding 10 OEMs that include both. Your Honor, with regard to... But it's to just the inclusion of one excludes the other. That's, that's your proposition. That's right. That's what the district court found in these circumstances, that the inclusion of one... With, of, with, with ten including both, is that perhaps clearly erroneous? The fact is that the district court found that as a result of this campaign, Navigator was well, only that, on a... Let's, let's, let's just go back on uh, finding 159. Is it clearly erroneous to say that... Uh, the inclusion of IE necessitates the exclusion of Netscape when there are 10 OEMs that do it. We don't know the level it, of... Maybe it's something peculiar about the firms that complained. Your Honor, it depends where Netscape is being uh, contained on those OEMs. For instance, as the court, the court found that Navigator only was on a tiny fraction of the desktops. Of, of these OEM machines. Sure, Navigator might be there well, somewhere, but, the, but it would be a place that would not the due, be... The due diligence documents suggest that it's not all that tiny. What is it, 22 percent? Your Honor... I know you question the authenticity and well, uh, so forth. More than but. that, Your Honor, I'd like to direct you specifically to GX2116, which I think sheds light. This is a sealed document, so I am not at great liberty to speak of its contents. Is that short? Excuse me? Uh, no, it's not. This is it. Is it a chart? Or? No, it's not a chart, but it does get shed light on the 22% figure. And I believe you'll find that it will indicate that Navigator was not on the well, desktop can I just follow a, the, to a large extent. There, there is a chart, though, and I don't, I don't think it's uh, under seal. It shows that out of the 60... Uh, PCs that are manufactured by the various companies that Navigator's on four. I think that's right. Yes, four sub-channels of the six channels. Right. And yes. what percentage do those four represent? I'm not sure if we have a specific percentage, but it is low. Uh, the district so the court closest you have is the 22 percent figure in the AOL document. That is, that is, uh, Could those yeah, four represent 22 percent? I mean, that's good. We believe that 22 percent, what it represents, and I think that uh, Dr. Fisher testified to this and offers some clarity on these matters, is that 22 percent is best understood as representing that 22 percent of, of the OEMs that sell uh, PCs have Navigator on some portion of one of their lines. 
So it means the actual amount of coverage is far less than 22%. It's not on 22% of the machine, not only that there are 22% of the OEMs. Well, wait a minute, if, the, if, if, if these OEMs include Navigator on some of the units they ship, or some lines. Yes. The 22% simply represents the degree to which consumers want it, right? No, I, I think all it represents. Well, it's out there for them to choose. They can choose that line. All it means is that of the OEMs that are out there in the market, only 22% of them are carrying uh, Navigator. And then, oh, no, to no. what well, level, it, and only on some lines. The 22% figure, I'm quite sure, appears as a percentage of shipments. I think it's more ambiguous than that. And, and I refer you to our brief, but we do discuss this. And, and again, to the, the sealed exhibit that I spoke to before. Uh, Can I just ask you, is all of the evidence regarding how users, end users, react irrelevant to the line drawing that Judge Williams is asking you about. In other words, given the nature of the market that the monopolist is facing, are his actions, its actions, constrained by the nature of the end user's conduct? Or is that irrelevant? Are you talking about uh, well, Microsoft's the, actions constrained by end user conduct? Yeah, I mean, there was all the information that uh, Microsoft had that users would use what they got in the PC they bought. Um, and they led to that um, view of the end user's conduct. And the question is, is there anything wrong with that? Or does it constrain their conduct because they are a monopolist? I mean, is, my real question is, is the end user information irrelevant to drawing the line that Judge Williams is asking you about? I think it's highly relevant. Uh, Microsoft clearly understood through its own documents that the end users would use most likely the navigator that was most prominently displayed on their computers. And so for that reason, they took the step to ensure that their computers would be, their, their icon would be, be present and that navigators would not. And they went as far as they that's, could. That's that. the critical step you make. The presence of IE is the absence of Navigator. Never. Yes, and the factual findings support that. Now, I, I'd like, to, because the time is, is flying by, I would like to talk about some of the other types of, uh, some of the other channels of distribution. Uh, one matter but I'd like to... Before to, you do that, could yes. you just address the um, high, Microsoft's high-performance um, JVM? Because I have the same question for you I, uh, about that that I did about the uh, inclusion of IE in Windows. Um, as I read the district court's finding, it found it anti-competitive because it reduced portability, right? Yes, Your Honor. But there was no consideration that I could see in the district court of balancing that against the improvements that Microsoft built into it. Uh, Your Honor, I think that the district court noted that <coughs> Microsoft was entitled to develop a high-performance JVM, right. uh, and that alone would not have been anti-competitive. But what Microsoft did in addition was to add developer tools that were designed in a sense to hoodwink developers, to fool them into using... Meaning uh, what, precisely? Meaning that these developer tools had keywords and compiler directives that were specific to so the your point Microsoft is those, implementation those, of Java. Those keywords were not... Y your view is that those keywords were not necessary for Microsoft to improve uh, the JVM the way not, it's not exactly the was they were completely separate that there were other that right. they uh, there were there were things Microsoft did I guess the, the pushing of J direct and that sort of thing that you conceded enhanced speed but had had some effect on uh, essentially making pure Java less attractive and then for the key words you saw that as uniquely bad, in the sense of having no uh, normal business justification. Your Honor, with regard to the key words, the problem with that and the compiler directives is that they did not inform developers that if they use these, uh, these key words and compiler directives in writing their programs, their programs would not be cross-platform. They would only run on the Microsoft system. And Dr. Gosling testified that this did lead to developer confusion. But you don't make that argument as to, do you, as to JDirect, and you don't 
make it as to the sort of generally fast character of Microsoft's Windows JVM. The JVM by itself, we have not pressed that issue that developing... Are you saying that there was nothing anti-competitive about the high quality Microsoft mm -hmm. Windows JVM? That by itself, we did not view as an anti-competitive act, simply developing technology that works better. What works, what is anti-competitive is then accompanying it with developer tools that are designed to fool developers so into writing only on one program. So tools. I'm sorry. Turn, your, the proposition turns entirely on the developer tools. No, there's another aspect to this too that I should mention, and that is that Microsoft in its implementation left out a very important uh, Java API that's known as JNI. And JNI makes it easier to port a program from one platform to another when there's a need to make native calls. And in not, by not including the JNI, when it was easy to do so, they again had the effect of reducing the cross-platform capabilities uh, Let me Java. ask you this. I, I really, I just can't remember. I'm sitting here trying to recall. Did Microsoft say in its packet to the developers that uh, this is perfectly consistent with Java's aim to be a cross-platform piece of software? I don't recall, but I believe that their J Direct, there was a preface at the beginning that certainly would lead a user to believe. I can't say that I have because a clear recollection. Because that really important. I just don't remember. I have to go back and look at it because Java is clearly a programming tool that may or may not be used for cross-platform purposes, right? Yes. And if Microsoft is competing head-to-head -head with Java in this, this nascent middleware market. It's not surprising that Microsoft would not write to the cross-platform piece of Java or use Java in that way. That it would write, it use Java, the powerful programming tool, for its own purposes. Yes. The deceit would only be to suggest otherwise, right? Well, yes, Your Honor. Now, where is there something in the record that they suggested otherwise, as opposed to the, there being some developers who didn't pay attention? As I, as I said, first of all, Dr. Gosling, who was the creator of Java, indicated that developers were confused. That, that, but that may be, but were they confused because they were not attentive, or were they confused because Microsoft labeled something to indicate, look, this is part of the whole cross-platform uh, uh, Java piece, and we're, we're, we're making an offering. We think it's a little better than what Java's doing, but it's not inconsistent with cross-platform functionality. Your Honor, that I, again, I think that we would both have to go back to look at the preface of, of Java, but in addition, we have the Microsoft internal documents that indicate that this was a specific goal of Microsoft. Oh, I don't have any doubt that they were writing. See, that's the irony in this case. That's what Judge Williams keeps asking you. They're competing. They're not hesitating. They tell you, we're, we're competing with Java, we're competing with Netscape. We all know that. They are competing for the middleware platform. They do not want to give it away. That, and I, that we understand that. So, but it's not, so it's not surprising that Microsoft would take Java and use the programming tool sans cross-platform. The question then becomes whether these actions of deceit are anti-competitive. No, no, whether there were actions of deceit, because it's not surprising that they're using the programming tool only to write to Windows. Well, there certainly were actions of deceit from Microsoft's perspective, from its own internal documents. They say such things as subversion is our best, is our best tool. Uh, perhaps I can give you some of the quotes from, uh, from. Uh, we're getting back to my yeah, grocery store. You, <laughs> you get to what the acts were that you say were the acts of deceit, not why Microsoft can be shown to have known they were acting nefariously, but what acts is it you're saying are acts of deceit? Well, the, the acts of deceit here are the development of the, of the developer tools that were misleading from an objective perspective. And we add to that that Microsoft misleading knew that. Because? Because they did not alert developers that if they wrote using these tools, they would not be writing cross-platform applications. It's not inherently misleading to not tell somebody something. What, what, if anything, did Microsoft affirmatively do to mislead or deceive? Well, again, this goes back to the discussion that Judge Edwards and I were having, that as I recall the actual representations in the, the Java developer tools, it did suggest that these were going to be cross-platform tools. But again, I would look to what Microsoft's own documents say, GX 1327, where Microsoft's John Ludwig emphasized subversion has always been our best tactic with regard to Java implementation. Uh, a later email, 
and this is this is GX 1332 quoted counsel the problem with that is and that's what I was trying to suggest earlier that that only is helpful if you have conduct that is reasonably confusing and it might it, it might lend some clarity uh, otherwise you just have the grocery store your honor I mean, they can kill things. They may have other problems and under other laws, but it doesn't mean that they violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Your Honor, we think the internal documents here are highly relevant because they indicate that Microsoft knew how this market worked. If you can point to some specific conduct that's confusing and then the internal documents give some clarity with respect to that conduct. And Microsoft surely thought that they were confusing enough. And I quote, we should just quietly grow JXX share and assume that people will take more advantage of our classes without ever realizing they're <coughs> building Windows 32, 32 only Java applications. I, they qu they does quite clearly that focus, does, does that in some meaningful way focus on the non-use of JNI? That does not. This particular passage is going to the developer. You, you have to link up the statements of evil purpose with specific <laughs> conduct. In the case of JNI, I think the answer there is that it was cost-free for Microsoft to include that. And in fact, they were sued by Sun for failing to include it as part of their contract. And in addition, that it was not to Microsoft's benefit not to include JNI because the more programs that were written for Java overall that could run on Windows in any form would be beneficial to Windows and serve as a complement that would make Windows more attractive. Mr. Muneer, I need to <clears throat> take you back for a moment to the 22 percent issue. Yes, sir. This is your brief. Microsoft's challenge to the district court's finding, <clears throat> the finding being, uh, pardon me, that, uh, that uh, Microsoft, quote, largely succeeded in exiling Navigator from the crucial OEM distribution channel, close quote. Now, exile is a little less precise than a percentage figure, but that's what the district court said. Microsoft's challenge to the district court's finding rests on one ambiguous statement in one document coming out of the November 98 AOL Netscape acquisition. You then quote the document and say this is portion was unsealed. And the quote, quotation is, estimate client, i.e. navigator browser, on 22% of OEM shipments with minimal promotion. So not 22% of the OEMs were shipping some units with navigator. 22% of the units shipped had Navigator. And therefore, it would seem to have been open to consumers on the merits to choose units with Navigator to the, to the greatest extent they wanted, to whatever extent they wanted. It could have been 70% if that's what they preferred. Your Honor, I would point, that, uh, point out uh, Dr. Fisher's testimony, where he discussed this at some length, the ambiguity of this statement. All you have with regard to document uh, DX2440 is that single statement, which I think is ambiguous. By contrast, exile what, what exactly grant you is, is ambiguous. 22 percent seems rather precise. But more important than that, that 22 percent was not on the desktop. And if you examine uh, GX2116, or uh, I've forgotten now whether it's GX or DX, I think it will make that clear. And being on the desktop uh, was of critical importance here. The record support for fact finding 239 on OEM foreclosure, I think is really quite compelling. I would point to uh, Mr. Barksdale's direct testimony, paragraphs 159 through 161, where he indicated that there was a decrease in the, uh, a dramatic decrease in the availability of, of Netscape. He explained in the uh, availability now. We're not talking about the, the degree to which it was chosen, but the degree to which it was made available. The degree, the degree to which it was chosen, I think it's accurate to say, that the fact was that it was on very few. I think that his testimony, as I recall, paragraph 173, indicates that it actually goes through user by user and indicates on how few machines it was carried and how it had minimal or little promotion. And that is key here also, the fact that the exiling term, I think, is accurate in describing what uh, Microsoft Actions did with respect to the uh, Netscape's navigators availability on the OEM channel. Now we haven't talked uh, at all about the IAT channel, and I'd like to talk about to that briefly, but before we do, I would simply mention the screen restrictions also. And with re the, this court raised questions of copyright with regard to whether or not the copyright provides 
an affirmative defense for the anti-competitive conduct that Microsoft engaged in. The district court in this case, I think there was a discussion of the findings of fact that the district court made. The district court told Microsoft in the motion for summary judgment, you have to come forward with more information. You have to show what code is actually you're claiming a copyright for. And you have to provide a factual basis on which to make a copyright defense. And Microsoft made no effort along those lines. That's significant. That's why the district court questioned whether a copyright issue was even in this case. And in fact, even now, Microsoft hasn't really provided a tenable copyright theory. I'd like to ask you a First Amendment question. Suppose that Microsoft is able to include the code that is involved in the browser in its shipments, right? Just have the code. And as I understand it, the government is not contesting that the bulk of the code, the four libraries, can be included, right? In the stipulation that entered into 98, it accepted that, certainly. Okay? Your Honor? But it's forced to allow OEMs to put Navigator on the desktop, right? And have it appear in the initial boot up. Yes. Can Microsoft also require the OEMs to have on the screen a little notice saying, your friendly OEM is putting up Navigator. We think IE is really great. And to get access to IE, do the following. Would that be all right? I think the answer is here. We have to focus on what we are talking about are not the copyrights themselves that are involved, but rather conditions on the licensing of the copyright. And those each have to be evaluated for their legality and their lawfulness. I'm just trying to figure out how far the government goes in its belief that Microsoft cannot have IE out there with Windows. And it seems to be a critical claim that although it can have the code in Windows, it's got to allow the OEMs to suppress the availability of the browser. And what I'm saying is, do they possibly have a right to just alert the end user who actually would like IE that it's tucked away there? Or is that a violation of the antitrust laws? I wouldn't say that that is a clear violation of the antitrust laws. Well, is it an obscure violation of the antitrust laws? Well, again, I think it's a difficult question you're asking. I'm not sure that I can give you an answer. I think it has to do with the meat of the claim that inclusion of IE at all is itself a violation. But you don't push 100% of the way because you allow inclusion of the libraries, which is the bulk of the code. I would point out to your honor how modest some of these changes are in terms of copyright interests. For instance, the removal of the IE icon from the desktop. That is something that any user can do, and yet they prohibit the OEM from removing that icon. It's not clear that that's protected by copyright law at all. This is a matter of pushing a button. They haven't deleted or changed any code. Are Netscape's license agreements with OEMs in evidence? I believe that some of them are. They may perhaps be sealed. Do you know whether they allow, whether Netscape allows alterations to Navigator by OEMs? The general practice among other OEMs with respect to other software vendors is to allow these types of changes that Microsoft objects to. So Microsoft is surely acting differently than other operating system vendors act. Do you know, though, when Netscape enters into a license agreement with the OEM, for example, is part of the license agreements that are in evidence, and we can check this, a requirement that the Navigator icon appear? I do not know the answer to that, your honor. Following up on some of what I hear Judge Williams asking, what is your greater concern? The inability of the OEMs and the consumers to suppress, i.e., or the failure of Microsoft to allow Netscape to appear front and center, first boot up? Well, it's hard to choose between the two, but I think I would point to the latter. That what we're concerned about here is that OEMs and consumers have a choice of browser. That the choice not be dictated 
by the aspects of the market that, are, uh, that Microsoft understands and takes control of. As so it's the latter. Of. That is, Netscape ought to appear as a possibility. I uh, yes, I, th well, I think that's right, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking which you see as the, as the grave of concern in your book. Yeah, ultimately... Which the, is the grave of concern? The, the, gra the, 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 the fundamental concern that I have to emphasize again here is that there be consumer choice and competition on the merits of the two products that are being offered to consumers. But, but if the two are mutually exclusive and OEMs are the ones who are the gatekeepers, the OEMs that choose Netscape will prevent consumers except for the extent that, of course, the, the OEM market is itself competitive, will uh, prevent the end users from getting access to IE. Right. But I think that the, the point that you made is an, is an important one here, that the OEM market, by all, all appearances, well, is then very what, competitive. Then what's the worry? The, 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 pe the people who like IE will, uh, will go for the OEMs that have IE. The people who like Navigator will go for the OEMs that carry it. But this goes back again to the problem of the two browsers on one machine that the OEMs determined was not satisfactory, that cons it con confused consumers, it increased their costs, which ultimately increased consumer costs. So the fact is that the OEMs are a good proxy for what the consumers wanted, and the consumers wanted access to Navigator. And all the OEMs were looking for was to have a choice, to actually have the How do we know that's a good no, no, proxy? No, no, no. I mean, I just, it, it really doesn't follow to me. I mean, thinking as a consumer, quite the contrary. Your preference would normally be to have both available and you make the choice. But you keep dropping back to the prior stage, which is very confusing in the argument. Well, the other alternative, of course, the, uh, a, a fine alternative is for the OEMs to be able to offer their consumers a choice by simply uh, providing that information during the startup. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what the record says about this, but again, intuitively, I think consumers with a modicum of ability in this area would prefer to have both there and fool with them themselves and make their choice at that stage, not at the time of selling the equipment because the consumer doesn't know what he or she is looking at at that stage. When I buy the computer and an OEM says, do you want IE or Navigator on, that question for many consumers is a question that has no import. They don't understand the difference. But the OEMs are in a position to do surveys to make determinations of what consumers want. Well, what will their surveys show at a point where Navigator has 80% of the market and IE 5%? Well, it might very so well show. They'll show that nobody's ever heard of IE, right? That might, that might very well be the case. But what IE has to do is compete on the merits to show that they have a better Which, which you can only do by persuading the OEMs to carry it and the OEMs won't carry it because of the market surveys, right? By, as you've just said. But this is, the, this is the same constraint that anyone is faces in a market that's subject to network effects. And the key here is that you do not employ anti-competitive tactics as a monopolist to prevent your, part, your, your product from reaching the end user. Now, I'd like to speak just very briefly to the IAP panel because I do think that that's important. The contracts that were involved there, I think, are clearly exclusionary. The contracts, the AOL contracts were mentioned before. Uh, this, these contracts basically had five, four critical features. First, they required the, that the uh, AOL distribute Internet Explorer uh, as its default browser. If that alone were all that, uh, all that uh, Microsoft had bargained for, that would not pose a problem. But in addition, those contracts prohibited organizations such as America Online to, to respond to questions, to provide an alternative browser unless a subscriber is specifically asked for it. And in addition, put a cap on the number of copies of an alternative browser that uh, the AOL could provide. Now, there is no competitive justification for these types of caps. Again, IE is a no-revenue product, so it can't be justified on increasing revenue here. And either browser is likely to improve <coughs> Either browser is likely to improve the attractiveness of Windows. So the, the, re the, ge the revenue generating product, Windows, was uh, enhanced by either browser. This is the type of exclusionary contract conduct that has traditionally been discouraged by Section 2. On top of that, we also have the types of threats and coercion that were directed to particular OEMs. Uh, Excuse me one second. With, with the cap and AOL. As I understand the record, the, the finding is that the, the users there 
are the quintessential novices, right? That's correct. And so the cap never really was a constraint. They used whatever AOL shipped. That was in part because they had no way of finding out about the alternative or knowing that it was available on AOL. The ISPs, the internet service providers, and the online uh, service providers, uh, both of those, those groups are generally agnostic with regard to the browser. They want to meet consumer demand. If a consumer wants Navigator, they provide their system with Navigator. If a consumer wants IE, they No, no, the evidence it. is that the consumer doesn't have a preference, the AOL, can, the AOL user, right? They don't know anything about this choice. Well, I, I'm not sure that the evidence shows that. I think consumers come in, in all fashions, that some are knowledgeable, some are not. But in any event, it is truly peculiar to say that there's a 15% cap on subscribers that come from any source, not simply from the desktop promotion. Now, Microsoft... There's an interesting passage in, uh, from Jefferson Parish, which will bear more perhaps on time, but has some uh, application here as well, to the effect that... Um, here. Um, oh, sorry. I, the, the, I can't find the quotation, but the, 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 the passage is to the effect that any, any consumer who knows that there's an alternative is sophisticated enough to choose it. <laughs> well, I, I think that that's a broad that dealt with anesthesiologists. Your Honor, your Honor I, I think that you, you do go. have to look at the character. The evidence indicates that some uh, surgeons and, pati uh, and patients preferred respondent services to those of Rue. But there's no evidence that any patient who was sophisticated enough to know the difference between two anesthesiologists was not also able to go to a hospital that would provide him with the anesthesiologist of his choice. Your Honor. Now, that's, that's putting the burden on those who would show that the consumer is too stupid to figure this out, which but, is, in this case, the government. But if that were the case, Your Honor, <laughs> but, Your Honor, if that were the case, why would Microsoft impose these restrictions? Why did it impose the requirement that you cannot uh, inform or tell your subscribers that they have an alternative? They have to affirmatively ask. Why did it impose the condition that you cannot convert more than 15%? It's because they understood the They told us it was because the same reason you gave. They wanted to encourage applications to be written for their, for their browser. They wanted to discourage navigator usage in order to maintain their monopoly. That is what the district court found. And that is, we, is what we submit was the motivation and the purpose and the effect of those provisions. Mr. Minio, we have some confusion on the clock. You've got about four more minutes or so that you have an understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I think I would just like to turn to the, cu the cumulative effects of Microsoft's actions, because we've been discussing their actions seriatim, as if each one were an individual, uh, unrelated piece. But as the district court recognized, Microsoft's conduct was not simply a series of isolated, unrelated events but rather a coordinated course of anti-competitive conduct. And that conduct was directed to maintaining its monopoly power. The district court found that Microsoft spent and forewent vast revenues on numerous front fronts in a campaign to discourage navigators' usage and thereby prevent erosion of the application's barrier. Can I ask you, is it, is it the government's position that the same standard for exclusionary conduct applies under Section 2 as Section 1? No, Your Honor. We do take, in terms of, uh, if you're talking to the exclusionary conduct, let me rephrase that. The district court, we believe, erred in rejecting the exclusionary characteristics of the conducts under Section 1. Because uh, he said it was total. He, he said, said it required total foreclosure. We believe that that was incorrect, but we did not take an appeal on that because the remedy provided the relief that we needed as to that count. But we believe that the section you, two You could have taken a conditional cross appeal, <coughs> couldn't you? Well, we could have, Your Honor, but we oftentimes do not uh, uh, take appeals even though issues may be incorrectly decided. That's a function of the Solicitor so General. That's, so that's going to be settled if, the, if this matter is back before the district court. That aspect will be foreclosed because you, the didn't, exclusionary you, you contract, didn't appeal it. Contracts will not arise again as, as far as their, their status under Section 1. Uh, but in any event, I'd like to point out that under Section 2, those contracts did, in fact, have an exclusionary impact in the context of our Section 2 claims in being anti-competitive. Now, the district court correctly found that Microsoft's actions were not competition on the merits. 
they were not profit maximizing and there made no business sense except for the expectation that they would preserve microsoft's monopoly power microsoft's actions were effective my navigators you should plummeted during this period by thirty percent and has continued to fall now the court correctly found that microsoft's actions had as their it's purpose and effect to fall? up until the remedy occurred in uh, the remedy exhibit Are you is, talking as of today I mean, i'd have to step outside the record to speak to that issue uh, and i'm happy to if you would like but uh, well, ha I mean, it's like hiding a elephant with a handkerchief i mean we, the, 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 there's something that happened isn't there fairly recently that i was no I, your honor just so i can be i want to be candid with the court i was referring in terms of continued to plummet after the trial ended the microsoft's uh, navigator share continued to fall and that's reflected in remedy exhibit 23 and i won't speak to what's happened since since that time since that's outside the record what's important is that microsoft's actions were a deliberate attack on the on the competitive process the court correctly found that Microsoft's actions had, as their purpose and effect, the preservation of Microsoft's monopoly power, and that's <coughs> monopoly maintenance. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Gross, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, let me uh, start. Uh, uh, about where Mr. Manier left off uh, on uh, the uh, internet access provider contracts, and that would include the AOL contract. Uh, the district court found that those contracts were not exclusionary and were not a violation of Section 1, and the district court did not believe that Section 1 was violated if only if there was complete uh, uh, foreclosure from the market. The district court understood perfectly well because it said so in its summary judgment position, it, its summary judgment opinion that there had to be substantial foreclosure and that, that and if there was substantial foreclosure that would uh, give rise to a violation of section one. In fact, the, dis the district court found that Netscape was not foreclosed from offering its products literally to every PC user worldwide. That's the phrase that is used, indicating that the district court understood that the market was not segmented on the demand side and that, if you could, and that all users could be reached. Uh, second, on the question uh, of whether uh, developers were in some sense impeded uh, uh, in writing applications for Navigator, uh, I respectfully invite the <coughs> court's uh, attention to finding 28 entered by the district court, which is that Navigator never exposed sufficient APIs to host personal productivity applications. Uh, third, uh, as to the meaning of the uh, entry in Defendant's Exhibit 2440, which is Goldman Sachs summaries of the due diligence performed by AOL and Goldman Sachs specifically relating to shipments in the OEM channel. I think the statement is pretty clear that what they are finding is that, that what they have found is that Navigator was present on 22% of shipments in that channel with uh, little uh, 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 effort, uh, with li little effort being made and, and little promotion effort being made. And if you look just below that entry on that page, you will see that specifically it says that, Nav that Netscape was not paying anything. What to about just above that entry? There's something called the, there's 40 million in the Mira market. What, what does that mean? Yes, uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, there is uh, a, an analysis uh, of the distribution of the 160 million right. that were distributed in uh, 1998. 
and the analysis, if I remember it correctly, is that approximately 60 million were distributed from Netscape's website and so-called mirror sites. A 40, mirror million, sites. 40 million from the mirror sites, but what is a mirror site? A mirror site is a non-Netscape site that is authorized by Netscape, uh. Netscape to provide Navigator or other products for downloading from that site. Okay. The other figures that appear just below that, uh, Your Honor, is 100 million copies on the part of so-called Netscape partners, and I believe that Netscape partners numbered somewhere in the number, uh, somewhere in the range of 15 or 16,000. And if you're interested in who the I in what kinds of firms were made up this uh, 15 or 16,000 universe of partners? You, all you need to do is look at Defendant's Exhibit 9, which provides a, uh, uh, a statistical I'm, I'm uh, analysis. Okay. This won't reveal my ignorance, but it, uh, I hadn't focused on the breakdown of the 160 million. Are, are you saying, in answer to Judge Randolph's questions, that? 60 million were actually downloaded from Netscape's website? That, from Netscape's website and mirror sites. That's correct, Your Honor. So 60 the, so million. The, I mean, I have to say that, that uh, I've only done downloading of these things with the help of much more skilled people. So I, I took seriously the proposition that that, that was a big barrier. But uh, 60 That's million people just downloaded it? One could surmise, yes. <laughs> 60 million downloads, not one, necessarily 60 million individuals. And I think we have to assume that it was not one person downloading it 60 million times. <laughs> I think there are probably room for variations in between those two. Uh, uh, why was this not clarified in the record? I mean, why are we guessing as to what that reference means? I, I, I think. The, the reference to the 22 percent, I think it, I think it was clarified in the record. I think what happened is that uh, plaintiff's principal economist, Dr. Fisher, tried to suggest, as counsel for the government did, that the phrase "with little promotional effort" meant that uh, meant that there was little promotional effort being made by the OEM by the OEMs who were making the distribution. I and understand, but I mean, we're guessing here. You say, well, one person didn't download it 60 million times, but, you know, large corporations, etc. Who the, knows? And I'm just not clear why this wasn't all clarified. I, I think the answer to your question is that Mr. Barksdale testified that he doesn't know who's downloading. He doesn't know what? Sorry. I, excuse me. I, I misspoke. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand precisely the ambiguity that, you're, that Your Honor is inquiring about regarding the 22 percent. Well, we're trying to find out. I mean, Judge Williams has suggested he's a difficulty he has. Maybe your assistant has the answer. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, because of the, uh, uh, the case was handled on a pretrial basis, we didn't receive this document until after the case in chief had been completed, and there and there was no witness. Did not allow you an opportunity to clarify this? There this seems to have grown in significance. There, there wasn't a witness called. Documentary witness. An additional deposition. The, the question is how, how many users does 60 million downloads represent? That's the bottom line. And the answer is we don't know from this record. Is that correct? Uh, we don't know precisely, but I think we have to assume that 60 million downloads is a significant number in a market where there are approximately 100 million Internet users worldwide at that time. I also need to say that the 60 million download figure is then supplemented by another distribution of 100 million through these Netscape partners. So we're looking at aggregate distribution of 160 million copies. Where, where in the record does the 60 million show up? 
Defendants Exhibit 2440. Uh, I'm also r reminded by colleagues that uh, there is a document in the record uh, which says that approximately 50% of Netscape's user base uh, was secured through downloading. Yeah, that's that survey uh, that one of your witnesses testified about. Uh, Your Honor, I think it's Defendant's Exhibit 2583, and I believe that's, I believe that's an internal Netscape document uh, because of the uh, code number, and it would be at page 36457. That is for the 50% of their user base being secured through downloading. To respond to a question you asked earlier, Judge Williams, if our supposition is correct that Netscape was securing this level of distribution through downloading and through its partners, it would make perfect sense not to rely on the OEM channel for distribution uh, if that required paying the OEMs. Now eventually, Netscape came to a point in January of 99 where they did uh, enter into an agreement with Compaq, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which was essentially a barter agreement. Compaq uh, preloaded uh, Navigator on the Presario. But by this time, Mr. Urowski, uh, this was 98, or it was, what, what year was the, the uh, Goldman Sachs document created? Late 1998. Yeah, but by that time, Windows or Microsoft was giving it away, right? I mean, they, they really had no other choice but to, but to give it a month. Netscape did. That's, that's correct, and they began free distribution in uh, January, sorry, in January of 98, I think. And that was in response to when, or to Microsoft, not charge. That's correct. So the, 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 the standard that uh, all this is ultimately directed to, as I recall, but this may, I may have been confused, is whether there was a substantial amount of commerce foreclosed, correct? That's, cor that's correct. And you're saying no because people who wanted Navigator got Navigator. That's correct. Why isn't the appropriate measure of whether a substantial amount of commerce was foreclosed whether revenues dropped from whatever it was to close to zero for because, Netscape. Because in this business, th there is frequent free distribution of products which are offered in connection with other products or services that generate the revenue. In the case of Microsoft, IE, uh, generates additional sales of Windows. In the case of Netscape, distribution of Navigator drives uh, 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 attention to the NetCenter website, which generates revenues. Uh, in the case of... Yeah, but I don't understand why that's... Because of that, what you're saying about this market, why that is an answer to, a, to the, qu the legal question of how one measures foreclosure when asking was there substantial foreclosure? I think that what, if there is, substan is substantial foreclosure, <clears throat> it has to be of distribution, meaning that the supplier was unable to reach the public, and that, it's, and that you may measure that in markets uh, uh, where products are distributed at a, at a positive price in revenue in markets where it's not, it seems much more sensible to look at it in terms of units. And our contention is that Netscape was not foreclosed. Yeah, I, you know, I think, Mr. Yurowski, that maybe, maybe this lies underneath your answer, but I, I would think that, that it would be more productive to search and 
for an explanation in terms of whether we're talking about consumer welfare or competitor welfare and in this context as opposed to tying i think we're still talking about consumer welfare which suggests that we should be looking at consumers access to the units and not netscape's revenues from the units that's that's my that may may not carry over and may or may not carry over into tying which is something of an outlier within the antitrust universe Mr. Uh, your time may, is may, I, may i ask one question I, if in fact 60 million users were somewhat less than that downloaded navigator in 1998 then how can it be that netscape's market share dropped so precipitously because the market was exploding and therefore even though netscape's share declined the absolute number of users increased dramatically but you, you said there's 100 million users 100 it, million users overall worldwide, wor worldwide in and, that's and the, some that's of the, some navigators are being shipped on oems and, and some and 60 million uh, uh 60 million downloads so how can how can their market share be down to whatever it was what 15 percent not 15 percent down in in 1998 it yeah. would have been approximately 50 five zero oh, percent so, okay uh, and that would represent a, a a fairly dramatic increase in the base of users the district court says uh 15 uh, from 96 to 98, from 15 million to 33 million, right. there is a better number, I think, certainly a consistent number in <laughs> Defendant's Exhibit 2440, which is roughly 38 million, and this is the Goldman, again, the Goldman Sachs. When the record summers. closed, what was Netscape's uh, market share? Uh, I think around 45 percent. Uh, but the uh, excuse me that has that measured as usage that's correct so obviously. another explanation is people were downloading it but didn't use it because they thought didn't like it that's correct it's a free download and you've got then both of them on your machines and you can choose which one to use that's correct uh, so you're asking what's the hundred million from exclusive distribution program in your uh, DX or GX 2440 uh, I'm sorry I couldn't it's the other hundred million it, which yes is, very, is obscurely described. Uh, Exclusive uh, distribution program partners, 16K partners. Right. Uh, I think the 16K is 16,000. And what's it mean? It means that Netscape had arrangements with other companies, apparently 16,000 of them, which provided that those companies would distribute Navigator. And uh, the reason I invited Your Honor's attention to defend defendants exhibit nine is that that contains a kind of at least rough statistical breakdown of what kind of company what kind of firms were in this group of 16,000 distribution partners you'll see a lot of OEMs your time is up mr. Yosky thank you very uh, much your honor concluded the argument on the first segment we will reconvene at 145 for the second stage today Following the morning session of oral arguments in today's Microsoft antitrust case, several observers talked to reporters about what they heard.